How's everyone doing today? All right. All right, so I don't really know what we're gonna do today, but we're gonna do something. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff we can do. There's some optimizations I wanna do in my IL. There's some optimizations I wanna do in my MMU and JIT. Uh, I implemented all of the 6502 instructions now. So we can now run any 6502 application. Obviously, we can't necessarily run like a NES ROM because that would require that we have a NES and emulate all those devices and things. Um, but we should be able to run any 6502 code we can build and, and run now. So that kind of puts us in like a, a cool situation where we're kind of open to, to try a bunch of different things out. So one thing that I noticed is that the... Um, the performance that I'm getting out of this, so let me let me see where we're at here. Uh, that we don't need. We'll move that over there. So I can go and uh, build this application. So I can build the test application, and in this case, it's going to build this like hot loop of uh, decrements and and loops. So and let me turn on. Oops. Uh, if I also turn on the instruction counters, we'll be able to see how many instructions per second we're getting. But actually having the instruction counter hurts performance quite a bit. It's it's like a 15% slowdown to have the instruction counter itself. Um, so instead, I'll, I'll run it with that on, and then I'll use that to kind of determine where... Um, where it's at. So in this case, it's it's running like 210. It'll probably end up growing to like 220 uh, billion instructions per second. Um, and then when I go to uh, turn off the um, instruction counting, it goes to about 260 billion instructions per second, which is a lot slower than what I would like for it to be. It should be it should be in like the 800 billion to like one trillion mark. So that is something that I want to look at. So if we take a look at the, the code generation that's occurring in this case, um, I can pop open the uh, IL file, and we can take a look at the IL that it's using. And there's an optimization that is relatively complex-ish to do generically, um, but maybe we could special case it. So let me see, uh, dev, soft serve. 6502 test and all right so this is the code that we end up generating and we don't really care about anything in the outside loop or at the end because this is the only part that's going to execute uh very frequently so one thing that i noticed is that this does a subtraction followed by a zero extension and this uh subtraction zero extension in the jit uh this will emit one instruction, just a, a vectored pack sub quad word. And then this will emit two instructions. It will emit a shift left and a shift right. Um, but when you mix, when you're working on x86, or quite frankly, any architecture, and you have a, when you have a changing of the um, instruction, the performance goes down quite a bit because the processor isn't decoding and working with the same instruction. Also, the uh, Xeon is bottlenecked. It can only do uh, two instructions per cycle. It can only decode two instructions per cycle. And that means that in this case, we have increased the overhead by uh, 66%, or technically we've, we've increased the overhead by 2x. We went from one instruction to, or I don't know, however you want to do your percentages or like increases, what, but we go from one instruction to three instructions. Uh, which is effectively going to make us much slower than what it could be. So if we got rid of these zero extensions, this would no longer be running 250 billion instructions per second. It would be running about 200 or uh, about 750 billion instructions per second. Um, and it would we'd probably end up making up the final tiny couple slivers uh, based on it being the same instruction repeated. So I've kind of thought of an optimization pass that's relatively simple, uh, but I don't quite know how I want to implement it yet. But effectively, the logic is, if you're doing, so my IL, uh, if we want a little refresher, my IL has, 
about like a dozen different uh, instructions. So, um, mod. Okay. So we can go look at all the different instructions that my aisle has, and it's it's quite minimal. So we have a uh, instruction to start immediate. We can ignore those because those uh, this doesn't matter. This one gets const propagated with the zero extension, so it doesn't matter. Um, these there's really nothing we can do about, so we just, we'll just ignore those entirely. Um, but the ones that are interesting are our arithmetic ones, and we haven't implemented the multiplies or divides yet because we haven't run into those. Um, so the optimization pass that I want that would really affect this would be technically for all arithmetic operations, uh, all of these arithmetic operations with the exception of shift right and shift arithmetic right, the value will always be the same if I don't do the zero extension, but I only do it at the end. So um, if I do an... For example, like a subtraction, if I do the subtraction here and then I don't do the zero extension and I do this subtraction and don't do this. So I basically only do the subtractions in this loop, but I keep the very last zero extension. The result will always be the same as if I did all the zero extensions. Um, so we should be able to remove those without causing any uh, errors in the... Um, it, we should be able to remove those without causing any errors during that optimization pass, which means that it would be sane in every situation, and that would be a good optimization to have. And I've done the I've done the logic. It would work for adds, it would work for subtracts, it would work for ands, ors, xors, and it would also work for shift lefts, but it would not work for shift rights or shift arithmetic rights, because shift rights and shift arithmetic rights could cause some of the high bits that maybe would be affected by these operations to get actually, ex quote unquote, exposed into this value. Um, so that's effectively kind of the optimization pass I want to write here. The correct way to do this would be to lift, um, basically turn the entire like graph into an expression tree or maybe at least a block into an expression. And then you'd use like a simplification algorithm on that expression. Um, however, I think that's just going to be a little bit overkill for what I need. So I'm going to look from a, a simple example of an extension followed by a an add sub and or XOR shift left. And as long as these are getting chained together, I should be able to remove any zero extensions in the middle or I can defer the zero extension. So the pattern the, that I'm gonna look for is going to be a one of the one of those arithmetic operations directly followed by a zero extension of the result of that operation followed by another arithmetic operation, and it could be a different one. It, I don't think it matters if I do an add followed by a sub or any, uh, any combination of these things, it shouldn't matter, followed by another zero extension. And we don't really have to worry about chaining of these things because if we implement one of them, the optimization will end up going through and looping through all of them and remove kind of the, the chain by just doing the same operation on the on the single sets multiple times. So that's the goal. Uh, we're gonna probably write that up pretty quick here. Uh, I'm guessing that'll take about 20 minutes. Um, so let's uh, let's dive into it. I actually haven't tweeted out that I'm streaming right now, so I'm gonna do that quick. All right. How's everyone doing today? Anything fun? Everyone at work or school or in class? All right, let me see. Um, okay, done. Do do do. Okay. Oops. And there. Okay. 
Ah. Huh. Uh, Link is not correct in, in Twitter. Sometimes Twitter like doesn't update the the tag for for links, which is kind of annoying. The or the card is what they call it. Like response mean people yeah, have it in the background. Yeah, no problem. We're just we're just chilling. So Okay, so let's uh, I'm gonna make a quick note of all the instructions that we can implement this on. Add sub and or XOR shift left. Oops. Shift left shift. Uh, we can't do the shift rights or any of those. And the multiplies and divides, there are some weird edge cases in those as well. Uh, I think we can do it on set conditional, because that just sets it to all Fs or all zeros. So if you're sign extending or zero extending, um, then I think that one's fine too. I'll just put maybe set cond. Yeah, that should be fine. Um, oh, that could affect the condition. So, so in some situations that wouldn't be supported. So that would be a special case, but we know for any value X and Y for an add for any value X and Y for a sub, uh, and or X or shift left, this should always have the exact same effect. So we should be able to make it work for these six operations, which are, which are kind of the core of, of most arithmetic. Um, and then Obviously, this will affect uh, zero extensions and sign extensions. We already already have an optimization pass for those. So, um, but these are what we'll want to affect. Uh, and then the pattern will be, uh, we're going to say that these are extends. And then these are going to be, um, and these are going to be, uh, what do we want to call these? Uh, we'll call those arithmetics. And then we'll say the pattern is arith uh, val followed by a zero extend, or followed by an extend of val into a, a new value, followed by a value equals arithmetic, where the value is passed into there for one of the arguments. It doesn't matter which one, it just is one of the arguments. I think, does it matter? Um, I Yeah, I don't think it matters. And then we'll do val equals extend val. And then this should be, can be optimized to val equals uh, basically the same thing except with this removed. It should have with an arg of val so and we can reason through that so for ands or xors that that one's really simple none of those matter uh and shift left so and or an xor so if we think about the problem here the by omitting an extension here that means that the bits that are quote unquote outside of the value so like the top bits um, that are no longer being used for the value because of the sign extension um, or zero extension. So these don't op these will technically modify those top bits, but it will never allow for one of those top bits to actually get shifted over or computed over into the value. So ands, ors, xors, and shift lefts are trivial. We just don't even have to worry about those. For subtracts, it's kind of weird where you think about like, what if you ended up in a situation where you're supposed to be zero extending and you have a value FF, um, actually let's say OO, and so this, and then you zero extend OXOO as an eight, which is obviously OXOO, um, and, or actually we'll do subtraction. So we'll do uh, OXOO equals OXOO, uh, so subtract from that a one, and that's going to end up with us getting all Fs. So we'll get a 64 bit value. And then we have our zero extension, which will cause it to end up being FF. Um, and then finally, we're going to do another, uh, subtraction. Let's say it's the same subtraction, in which case this is now on FF and this becomes fe and then we zero extend this value again which in this case is a is a complete not because nothing nothing actually needs to change here 
So the logic that we're trying to go through is that you can we remove this zero extension? And in the case of an add, we don't have to worry about it either because the add never will take top bits into the result. It will only push bits out there uh, due to carries. So subtraction is the only operation out of these six that could potentially take top bits and pull them into the value. So this is kind of the only case is that ninth bit is the only one that could affect things. But if you see what happens, if we were to remove this zero extension, we're now operating on this value, and then our result is going to be this, and then we zero extend this value, and we get our FE. So this is also correct. So while it is temporarily like in that register, it's this whole sign extended thing, the result is actually always correct, so it doesn't doesn't matter. And so that's kind of my like proof that uh, we should be able to optimize any zero extension of the same size in a chain of these operations. Um, so basically, we're going to convert any pattern like this into a pattern like this. And that should cause all of these zero extensions in the middle of the loop to get removed, except for the last one, which will have to stick around. So all right, does that make sense to everyone? So let's, uh, let's go to our optimize routine and see what we can do. We're going to call uh, did something is or equal self dot. Um, I don't know what's a good name for this. Uh, we could we could actually implement this in an opera remove, remove, but I want to keep this separate just so it's a little a little clearer and a little bit easier for us to um, reason about here. So let's call this um, extend illusion. Oh, I like that. Thank you, piston miner. That that sounds really cool, and it makes sense. So we're going to call that. All of these are going to return a bool, and this is going to return false temporarily. And this is going to say for arith operations in a set of add sub and or xor shift left, followed by an extension, followed by another of the another with mythic operation operation from that set followed by the same uh, extension we should be able to uh, we, we know we are we are able to remove the uh, first extension as it has no effect on the final result. Elision always sounds great and smart. It's so true. <laughs> okay. So we're going to like steal some things from regprop. We'll get the flow graph. Um, and I think what we're going to want to do is we effectively want this, which is just uh, an instruction enumerator. And we're going to build some metadata. I think what we want to do is we want to track, um, we're going to want to track effectively, hmm, I think we what we want to do is, so, uh, node instructions, actually, that I need to grab that from here, okay, and we don't need a mutable reference in this case, uh, so we can do self graph node. Okay, so we're going to go through all of the instructions, and what we want to do is, I think, um, I'm trying to think if I can implement it just in place, or if I'm going to need to compute metadata here. So, the only constraints are we have to, we have to do an arithmetic operation. We don't really care what it does. Then we're going to put it in a value. So we don't care what the operands are here. So x can be anything and y can be anything. And then the extension will obviously have to operate on value. So these have to be the same IL register. Then this has to go to another arithmetic expression. But in this case, um, x, one of x or y must be val. And we'll call this like the extended val, the eval. And then we'll call this one the um, 
Uh, I think we can call that val again, and we'll call this f val for like final val. So arithmetic uh, uh, one of x or y must be value. Um, if we don't have that connection there, then we don't actually have a chain like we have here, and we can't just remove um, those things. Um, the noun effect at 817. Um, it, yes, in this case it is with an E. Thank you. Hey, I never mind stuff like that because the, the more that you write those words correctly, the more that you adopt that and get more correct over time. So it, it is important to correct things like that. So thank you so much. Okay, so let's, we got our flow graph, we're going through instructions, and I think what we need to do is, so the difficult part here is if we don't go through and kind of build a database of what operates on what, there's actually no way that we're going to be, so basically at this point we have an instruction great so we're in theory looking at the first instruction of something we want to optimize but it's kind of expensive to then try to go look for where that value is used um and so when that kind of comes up we we kind of want to like pre-process this so we we know that information so i'm going to make a database here and we're going to make a um we're going to call like an ILR created, and this will be a hash map. Oops, can't type this morning. We're going to have a hash map that takes in an ILR reg and gives an ILR location. So effectively, this is going to tell us where um, ILR registers are created. And uh, so mapping of ILR registers to the instruction which created them. And then we also want another one which is ILR used. And this is gonna be a hash map of, let's see, ILR reg to a vector of ILR location. I think that'll do the trick. Okay. So we're going to go through this, and all we're going to do is we're going to accumulate these ILR created and ILR used databases. So we're going to go, um, so we don't even need the instruction IDs in this case. We'll just do this for instruction in here. Uh, for input in inst.inputs, I think I might call it ILR inputs or ILR reg inputs. Then I'm going to do ILR created.insert. We're going to say that this input register, and we'll, we'll grab a reference, um, that input is created at, and we'll make a location. Ah, now we do need that. <laughs> okay, uh, dot iter dot enumerate, and the location is aisle location, which will take a node and an inst ID. That's basically how I know where it is so we'll say create a location for this instruction and then we'll just insert location into this database and we'll assert that this is none um and let's see i'll reg created into places question mark that should never happen and then we'll go for output in inst.ilreg outputs We'll do ilrUse.entry for output dot um, or insert vec new. So we'll create a new vector entry if that is not in the database. And then we'll do a dot push location. In fact, this can be a set, a hash set. Um, so we'll call this a hash set. And then this will be a dot insert. Okay, so that looks good, and we can run this locally. Um, okay, expected that. Okay, maybe I don't need the DREFs on those, and then I'll reg out outputs. 
Okay, and of course these need to be mutable databases. Nothing fancy there. Okay, and then we just need to get rid of that because it's not a documentable comment there. And here we go. So we're gonna, we're actually just making sur sure that builds right now and it, it does of course, and we're gonna turn off our threads. We don't want 256 threads, just one thread while we're testing. That'll get us everything we need. And then I should be able to print these uh, databases. And then we'll also do a um, ILR created. And we'll put this ILR used. And then we'll do a self.dump.none. So this will update the graph. Okay. Perfect. Uh, is this already created in two places? Well, that's uh. Oh, I did this. I did this wrong. Outputs. I just had these flipped. Input. And that's why we put assertions like that. Um. Because if we, if we ended up not having that assertion there, uh, we probably would have ended up not realizing that, that we made a mistake. Because everything would have just compiled and worked and, well, it wouldn't have worked, um, but it would have built or run. Uh, why didn't I make public uh, function? Because this is called by the optimized routine and it's not actually going to be used in the, um, this is only used uh, internally to this file. And then, uh, are you running it on the server? Right now, I'm not for testing, but when I actually go to run it, I have to run it on the server. That server is the only computer in my house that's capable of running this code. It's a, it's a Xeon Phi 7210. It's a 64 core, 256 thread, 1. Gig, uh, 1.3 uh, gigahertz processor. So, and I think it has like, I don't know, 96 or like 120 gigs of RAM. I'm not quite sure how much RAM it has. Okay, so get this to run, wait for it to print, and this should be correct. Uh, I'm, I would be really surprised if this wasn't correct here. So I'm just looking for here. And here we have um, ILREG 126. Uh, 126, it says that it's used in one spot, and the place that it's used is uh, block 3. Instruction 31, yeah. Like, no surprise that this stuff works. Um, okay. I'll be getting one of the 128 core Epic chips. Probably not, so since Epic doesn't support AVX 512, uh, I don't really have a need for those Epic nodes. I'm kind of tempted to get one just to play around and, and work with them, but yeah, they don't support AVX 512. Um, so it kinda kind of sucks in that regard. Okay, so now what I'm trying to think of is this has told me all of the ILREG inputs and outputs for the whole uh, graph, but I might want to actually constrain this down to only uh, these six and the zero extend so we don't even have things showing up in our database. So I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to say uh, match, inst uh, match instruction, I'll inst add. Um, or, and I normally tab these in, add sub and or XOR, shift left, and then we also need the zero extend and sine extend. Okay, so for these, we do nothing, and then in all other cases, we're going to do a continue. So basically, we're going to skip anything that, you know, I, I think this is going to look cleaner in this case. In this specific case, this is a little cleaner. And I'm actually even going to put these out here. Okay. So add sub and or x or shift left, zero extend and sine extends are the only ones that we're going to actually accumulate in our databases. All the others are going to skip. So filter out 
operations we don't care about. Perfect. Okay, and we know that that's gonna work. So, now what we do is, now we'll actually write the optimization pass. And, and I've never written an optimization pass like this, so quite frankly, I have no idea what this is gonna look like. Uh, but I, I think with that metadata, it should be easy. So we'll do a dot get, uh, get the node, get mute. Um, okay. Perfect. And now, now we can look for that pattern. So I could say, um, we'll say, we'll go through each instruction and then we'll say, uh, first we'll make a filter for, um, ooh, hmm. maybe I make a little closure here. So I'm gonna make a, a little closure is arithmetic, and this is gonna be equal to um, the inst it'll take an instruction, and we'll just say this match uh, six tab that in. Now we get rid of these, and this will be true. Everything else false. We don't need the curly braces here. Okay. And then this, and then we'll make the same thing is extend. Um, we'll do zero extend and sign extend. So zero extend or sign extend, then we're gonna do that. So then our filter, we're gonna say if, if, inst or it's an extension or if it's not arithmetic and it's not an extension continue perfect uh found a reference yep so we can make these actually take references that's that's plenty fine here um I don't know if that'll get us the syntax we need. Not quite. I think if I just do, uh, if I just explicitly type that for the closure, I think that should get us what, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, really? I guess the like automatic destructuring doesn't work in the, okay. Huh. That's, that's kind of interesting. They have, like, automatic destructuring, but it doesn't seem to make its way through that closure. Um, okay, so we go through all of the instructions, and here we'll say, if, if the current instruction is not arithmetic, continue. So uh, this optimization will always start with an arithmetic operation. Okay, and then we'll say if, so now we get the outputs and there should only be one. So let output is equal to this dot unwrap. Um, actually, uh, I think I just grabbed this. Um, all arithmetic instructions only have one output register. So get access to it. Okay. And uh, I'll rig outputs. What? Inst. What am I doing here? Um. Oh, it expected a mutable reference? Fine, okay. So then, the <laughs> fine, 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 fine. Then this will just do uh, a deref on him. Okay. What? Oh, what? Wait. Graph. Get the mutable node. What? Why would that be a vector? 
Why would instruction be a vector at this point? It's the same as this. I'm doing something stupid here. Um, mutable vector to that. Uh, I'll get node. Do I just want to do a... Yeah, that should get the vector, and then the iter should affect that vector. I don't know how the... How is that instruction in that dot iter? Oh, dot unwrap. Okay, move occurs. Uh, oh boy. Uh, I should be able to demote these, actually. It's kind of like some weird interactions with these closures here, but so this should be fine. Uh, mutable borrow 870 and previous iteration of the loop. Um, starts there in a pre continue. Is it, it doesn't like this? Is that a, a no? It doesn't like this. The is arithmetic. For some reason, this uh, probably because it is a, a closure. Maybe if I if I made this a macro, then I wouldn't have that issue. Ah, uh, I think that's kind of weird. I guess with the closure, it's it's moving the reference in there, but I, I feel like it should be, the compiler should be smart enough to know that that reference is dropped when we go into the match and convert it into a bool, but I guess it's not, is, okay, and will this work, or was that all for nothing? Whoa. Uh, oh, no rules for it. Yeah, yeah. Yep, 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 yep. This, this, this. Boom. Okay, so this does work, indeed. So it was an issue with, like, passing into the closure. Um, kind of strange. Interesting that it can't propagate that lifetime correctly through that closure. Uh, even though the closure is returning a, a copyable object, it should be able to delete all of the, the lifetimes there. Um, but whatever, not a big deal. Okay, so then we get the outputs, and then what I want to do is I want to get the next, I want to find usages of this, and I want to say for usage in, uh, I'll are used... Um, first we have to make this fallible, so if let sum, uh, usages equals ilr use dot get output, so we're going to look in our database of where things are used, and then we're going to go through usage in iter, and the, the usage is going to be an, uh, usage location, so print uh, we'll say that this isle reg isle reg that is used at location simple and we just have output and you should location and that should go through all the places that it's used and then this just needs to be a ref and then we're just gonna see if these prints line up with reality so if it's not an arithmetic instruction, continue, get the output. Okay. So then here, we'll just kind of look at the very last one and we'll see that ILREG 273, or ILR 273, 
it's created here. So this is what, where we're currently looking at. So like when we actually print this, this is the instruction that we're looking at. Then we see that it is used at uh, block three at 67, which is true. And then it's also used at 65. So we know that it's used in these two locations. So that's cool. That works exactly as we want. So then we can say, if the usage location, um, so here I should be able to do, uh, ooh, I might not like this get mute here because we need to get access to the graph again. We're just saying, gonna say get temporarily here and we're gonna say uh, let usage instruction and maybe we can just store the instruction in here. If we store the aisle inst here, then we'll be able to just track um, map of uh, aisle registers to instructions that use them. So here we should be able to uh, store this aisle instruction in the aisle created database and then the location as well. So this will allow us to kind of quickly get access to that instruction. Um, and these don't implement copy, but I think they can now. I had a fee node in there that couldn't implement it. Yep, and it looks like we can do this now. So we'll go to 889. Okay, yep, of course. So uh, actually we need that in usages, not in ILR created. Technically we could use it in ILR created, um, but here this will be a set of this and I'll inst, so we'll keep a record of that. Okay, hash set, and then here we're gonna insert location followed by uh, a DRF of inst. Uh, hash is not implemented for I'll inst, 869. Oops, uh, struct. We just have to add a, whoop. And we'll just give this hash. Okay, nice. 870 will get us back to where we were. And then here we'll have usage location and usage inst. And then I can say if not is extend of inst continue. Uh, oops, usage instant instruction. So now uh, this will be usage location. So if it's not an extension, so now we look for an arithmetic operation that outputs to an extension operation. Do, 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 do. Okay, so this should be telling us all of the aisle registers that kind of go through that operation. So let's look at ILR 225. So it's saying that ILR 225 is used at 353, which is correct. That's saying that this is used in an extension. Um, do we have that used anywhere else? No, we don't. Um, I kind of want like a counterexample of something that gets extended but also is used, but we might not actually see one of those in this stream. I don't think there's any situation where that's going to occur here. Okay, so now we know that... Uh, yeah, I'm trying to figure out if there's a way for me to not just nest these really deep because that's going to get really gross. But what I, so like, um, make sure that the usage of the arithmetic instruction is a an extension. Okay, and then... Okay, I mean, I can just do two more for loops and we're there, but I kind of want to find a uh, like a, a slightly better way to do this. Um, I don't know. I just I just don't like a billion for loops in here, because this will look like the same thing. So then I'll look for uh for usages. We're just gonna write it out and see if the optimization pass works. Uh, and this is gonna get really gnarly. Um, so we're gonna say for usages in uh, usages of the output from the extension. So 
get the um get the usage to the um extension. So this will be look up the usage instructions, Islegs outputs, Islegs outputs. We're going to look up that output and then we're going to make sure that this is arithmetic. If that's not arithmetic, continue um skip non arithmetic operations. Yeah, we definitely could structure this code in a better way. Uh, but I just just want it working first. Get the usage to the uh, arithmetic. Okay, and then... <laughs> yeah, this is gross. I apologize for this. We'll find a better way shortly. Uh, get the output, and then here... Now we filter for extension. Uh, make sure it's an x. Uh, okay, and now I should be able to do that print here. So, and what I want to do here is we have the first location, and I'm going to, instead of shadowing all these, so uh, usage inst, uh, we're going to call this first, or we're going to call this usage inst one, this, 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 two, this, this, uh, actually, one, 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 two, two. Oh, this, that was a bug, so luckily, one, 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 two, 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 three, three, and then we don't actually get the output here. So I should be able to just print those four instructions. And then this will give us chains that follow that pattern. And then we also need to filter that the uh, extensions are the same type and the same width. But this will just get us kind of in the ballpark. And once we have this theory kind of fleshed out, then we'll actually um, uh, write up this code in a, in a cleaner way. But I like to go with like what I know is going to work out of the box. And that way I'm more, a little bit more comfortable... Um, with maybe testing or figuring out if it behaves the same. And, you know, in fact, I'm going to do this. And we'll just put a couple new lines there. So now this will hopefully print out better. So we'll see our chain, and it should be arithmetic followed by an extension, followed by arithmetic, followed by extension, and they should be valid locations in the graph. So let's take a look. Uh, so let's look at the very last one. So we're going to look for the uh, ILR257. So it's created in subtraction of 242 and ILREG 0. Then it's 0 extended into 258, taking 257 as an 8-bit. Then that value, uh, this ILR258, is then used in this instruction, which is another subtraction, which then gets its output passed to this zero extension. So it looks like that logic should be correct, uh, with the exception of we need to make sure that the extensions are of the same type and the width is the same as well. Technically, we can relax that width a bit, but I, I just, I'm a little uncomfortable with that right now. So we're going to say with the same width right now, um, and then we'll worry about uh, handling kind of edge cases there. So what I'm going to do is say, um, at this point, where we have the third usage and it's an extension, I'm going to get the... Uh, so we're going to get the discriminant. So the discriminant is basically like the enum type. Um, so that will tell us basically... It'll just extract like this part, the zero extend versus sign extend. So we're going to do this on usage inst1, which is an extension. And then disk1... Oops. Uh, get the types of the uh, ins uh, extensions. Yeah, same with well, yeah, it'll be the yep majority of cases, and that and that's why I'm not too worried about it here. Um, and then here we'll say if disk one is not equal to disk two, continue, um, and make sure they match. We'll put those there. 
Oh man, that even that doesn't fit. Okay, then we're gonna put them here. Okay, usage ints one, usage ints three. If they're not equal, then we're gonna continue. I don't think there's actually any uh, situations where that's going to occur here. Um, and we can just pop these out temporarily because we're not using those at all. Even here, we're not using them. Okay. So, I yeah, I don't think there's any situation right now where we're going to run into this uh, where it's a sine extension and a zero extension, but that should now work. So if, if for some reason one of these were a sine extension, we would just simply uh, 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 not optimize between them. And now what I need to do is... We now know that the zero extensions uh, use this IL register because this is the only input. So that means that we can just check the final part. So we can say the, um, uh, we can match. Honestly, we can probably do both of these. Like we can get rid of this and we can do both in this case. So we're going to do usage inst one, usage inst three so we're gonna match those into a tuple so we're gonna make a tuple here and then I'll say um, I'll inst zero extend uh, this val and then we have the next variance and this will be or this will be like the uh, size one size two so at this point um, if size one is not equal to size two, continue. Okay, and we'll just implement this exact same code for sign extensions. And then that implies the discriminant. So we're gonna say, if the usage instruction one and the usage instruction three, um, uh, if they're both zero extensions and the sizes, if they're both zero extensions and the sizes do not match continue out, um, if they're both sign extensions and they don't match continue out, and then we need a final case, which handles all other possibilities, which will just continue out. So, um, make sure the, uh, extensions are the same type and size. Perfect. And then that should be, uh, given I, uh, put some extra parens on here. We should be uh, pretty much done here. Uh, it'll have the output argument here too. Oh no. I think that's gonna be my, my cleanest way of formatting that. Okay, and Vim's doing some weird stuff there. I could also get rid of some of the spaces here, but I'm not a huge fan of that, so we're just gonna do this. Okay, and that, that's not going to fit on one line, is it? Uh, not qu not quite in the way that I like to format my code. So, if it's anything else, continue. If the sizes don't match and they're the same type, continue. So this should now have only the operations that we care about. So that means that we can go get the usage instruction 2 here. Um... And uh, actually, uh, this one, the first extension. So first extend lock is that. So then we'll make a let mute removals is equal to vec new um, list of instructions that we should remove from this stream. And here we can do... Honestly, I think we can do this in place now. Oh, not quite, not quite. Um, okay, so then we'll say removals.push, and we'll just throw in the first extension location. Oh, and even that doesn't fit. Uh, queue up this instruction for remo uh, removal. I know, I know it's gross. Um, push. Oops, this is the uh, removals. I know. Hey, now it does fit on a line. Or queue up, queue up the first extension for removal. 
Okay, yeah, we know that's gonna work. And then we're gonna go here to the end, and we're gonna say for removal and removals. We're gonna do, um, for this, we'll now do uh, self.graph.getMuteRemoval.0, which is the node ID. And then we'll unwrap it because we know it exists. And then we'll get the removal.1, which is the instruction ID, and we'll replace it with an ilinst nop. So perform the removals. And then here we'll return, uh, we'll, we'll do this, and we'll say uh, removals.len is greater than zero. If anything was removed, we note that this op optimization pass did something. Okay, and then finally, I'm going to just disable the um, I count stuff, which is here. So we'll say if track I count, we'll put this tab in, and we'll just put a constant up here, const track I count bool equals false. And then we need to do the dump dot, which I think we're doing, and that needs to be a reference here. Okay, so we'll remove that instruction. We'll replace it with a nop, which will get removed in another um, optimization pass. Uh, no entry for key. That is invalidate. Interesting. Um, I don't mutate anything on the graph. So let's just do this and say false. This should work. No entry for key. Okay, so get mute that removal one is a knob. Oh, oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, oh, oof. So, uh, actually, there, there's a huge issue with this implementation. So, um, basically, the problem here is that we're just replacing that with a NOP, but we're not replacing the usage of the ILR. Um, so let's, like, the pattern that we look for is like this right here. We're removing this instruction, which creates ILR62, which then means this gets sourced from who knows where. So I need to go find all, I, all in my removal list, I need to log the output from that zero extension and then I need to replace all occurrences of that with the original arithmetic result, with their uh, original arithmetic output. So we'll do uh, the orig output is this, and we'll take original output here, and then this, this is the um, first extend output here. No! First ex extend, uh, we'll, we'll call it extend output. Yeah, now we fit. <laughs> okay, so we'll get the original input and the, ex the original output and the extend output, and then we also need to log those. So we'll say, we'll push the first extension location followed by the um, orig output followed by this. And then, so this will now be for uh, removal location. And this is probably gonna throw us over the line. Yep, that's fine. So remove the extension. And then we're gonna have a ridge output, new output. Um, and if I look at regprop, I actually have this code here, right here, old ILR, new ILR. We'll do this, old ILR, new ILR. And technically, we have to change the order here. We're gonna say that that is the old one, the extend output, and we wanna replace it with that one. And um, 
remove usage of the extension aisle register. So this should do the trick. Nice. Uh, oh, I don't... Oh, we do have it on dump dot, don't we? What? 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 We're going to do a print removing this and renaming that to that. Removal location, followed by old ILR, followed by new ILR. This might actually not work if there are multiple um Okay. Removing three four. Which it, I guess it did. Hmm. Removing that and renaming that to two. I think that there's a chance that maybe we can't, if we do multiple removals in one run, that might actually break things potentially. I mean, So we got 33, we zero extend it into 34. Uh, Removals.line is greater than that. I think this is gonna like try and do all the removals. Uh, uh, we'll just say done. And we'll just do break. This will only allow us to do one of these optimizations per invocation of this function, which will be slow perf-wise. But I think there are some issues here. Um, Okay, maybe that is fine. Yeah, I, I don't think that works with register renaming because I could potentially end up like deferring multiple things that then get renamed to maybe the wrong things. Yeah, by the time you rename it, y yeah, the one you keep track of might no longer exist. Oh wait, that's SNES. Hey, the SNES is 6502 as well. We could probably do that. Uh. Remove the instruction. Let me make sure that I have dump dot enabled. I oh my god, I don't. <laughs> uh, I just assumed I had that. I should have double checked because I did question it. Yeah, it works. Totally works. And then let's think through the this renaming thing. If we queue up all the removals, is there ever a situation where they refer to the same outputs and extensions? And I don't think they do. So that was 43, and this is identical. I think this is actually fine here. Um, if it isn't fine, we'd end up getting a, a hard panic. Uh, so that would kind of let us so let's think is there a situation well this has just the repetition which would be the worst case and i think for some reason by nature of this extension because it's on the first arithmetic then we go to the second one i think this is fine because we do them in order but if we didn't necessarily do them in order it, it could be an issue I don't think these, the old ILRs and new ILRs will ever overlap. Yeah, and they don't in this case. And this is worst case because there's, they're literally just a stream of the, the subs and those. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think if there's a situation where there could be two candidates for optimization that start at the same instruction, and they can't. They can't. It's actually impossible because uh, the outside loop we're iterating through all instructions. There's no situation where we could have the same instruction 
uh, available as a candidate for two optimizations because we only have one optimization per thing. In fact, we could just do uh, next inst and we can just do this. So we go to the next instruction in our stream um, and this should now be correct in every case. There, I think there was one tiny edge case which was if one of these loops found another optimization for that exact same variable. Um, but this should now, it should only do one optimization per instruction, which on, only means one instance of a, well, I guess that could bubble forwards because we end up replacing all, well, the zero extension result will never be subject to an optimization, but you could have, if I did two subtractions, if I did one subtraction followed by another subtraction and I had both of them going into the exact same zero extension, that could be an issue. Okay, so there is an edge case there. So I'm gonna say uh, done and we'll just do uh, break done. And now we don't even have to worry about it. So now this is this is definitely correct in all cases because we only have one removal candidate. Uh, it means perf is not as good, um, but that's fine. Oh, this SNES was a 16-bit. Uh, okay. We could probably implement that pretty fast. Okay, so this optimization pass now looks correct. So we remove all those zero extensions and we keep the final one. And then that's what gets stored into the target register. Okay. So that's a pretty significant removal of instructions. So let's turn on the instruction counter. And the instruction counter now is going to be such a tremendous overhead in our, um, in our code. Actually, uh, we got to get rid of the dump dot. Do, do, do. And let's see what we get for perf. Oh, uh, that's single threaded. <laughs> it's like, man, we like completely destroyed perf, but that makes no sense because we reduced the instruction stream. Okay. Now we're getting, so we were at like 260 billion instructions per second. Now we're at 300 billion, but we're, we're bottlenecking on the, um, yeah, so here, this is saying, this is just probably bottlenecking on the, uh, adding the icon register, maybe? Uh, will that const prop? Not quite. I don't have an optimization pass for that either, so if I added one, that would probably get better. So in this case, it's, uh, let's say it was 260 billion before, and I'm gonna just do this math here to get the, um, instructions per iteration. So this is gonna give us, uh, actually I can take the billion instructions per second and I can divide that by fuzz cases per second. And this is now our, our magic multiplier that we can then turn off the uh, track I count. And this will allow us to derive the I count performance based on the fuzz cases per second. Um, is there a reason I can't perform the removal in place? Uh, since I just changed the opcode. Um, in this case, Rust was just kind of not going to be happy. Um, so that's kind of the only reason here. What was this getting? That was getting 500. Okay. So this is looking a little bit better. We're going to let that kind of, that number converge. But yeah, in, in this case, it was kind of just more of a Rust issue because I would have a mutable reference to the graph so that I could replace the NOP. And then I would also have another... Uh, I would have to also enumerate the graph. Um, actually, if I do everything by copy, I think I can do it in place. Uh, we'll go clean that up. So, yeah. Thanks for that. Famicom version of the Nest Legend of Zelda had arbitrary code execution via save game. Okay, that would be a really cool bug to look for. 
Um, okay. So the problem is uh, this reference here, but we're actually, we can do this by move because we made inst uh, copyable now. So I could do uh, self.graph node and then do this. And then we shouldn't have actually any borrows of the graph. Oh, well, the aisle registers that we talk, uh, we actually save the aisle registers here. So the aisle registers, we would have to update these databases. I'm just going to leave it like this. Um, I mean, technically, this is, this is just simpler um, here. So we'll just do this. Uh, but, but we actually pre-compute the inputs and outputs to instructions. So uh, let's make some comments here. Uh, go through each block in the graph. Go through each instruction in the block. Then this is going to be um, log where IL registers are created. Registers and log where IL registers are used. So since we log them here if we were to perform mutation here mutation here this database would have to be updated which would actually require enumeration unless we made like a a forward backward linked version of the hash map um and i'm just not too worried about the perf of the and here we'll just say removal equals none um instruction that we should remove from the stream and here we'll set removal equal to this and then here we'll say uh, if let sum this equals removal and then this will be uh, removal dot is sum perform the removal okay so now we can take this fuzz cases per second and multiply it by this magic Thing. And this is saying we're now running 485 billion instructions per second. Which is a, uh, compared to the 260 we were getting before, about an 86% speed up. Or effectively doubling uh, the performance of this. So, uh, that's actually really good. So, 400, 485 billion. So, this result divided by 2048 VMs times 1,000. So we're emulating, in this case, we are emulating uh, 2,048, 236, um, I guess it's not 236 megahertz. Let's see what a DEC is, a DEX. I think it's two, uh, 6502 uh, instruction sets, this. And basically, the bulk of everything we're doing is a DEX. And... That is two cycles, so we can multiply this by two. So we are emulating uh, 2,048, 473 megahertz 6502s on one server. Um, <laughs> well, that's pretty good. Wow. So we have we have uh, 2,048 of these. So this is the we're, we're emulating. We're emulating basically, like in total, uh, almost a, a terahertz of 6502. Um, and then if we divide this down by uh, the, the 1.5 the 1 mil, um, actually, I think it is 13 mil in the uh, 1.3 mil. Uh, so it's a 1.3 megahertz processor in the Atari 2600. Um, and I didn't want that to divide by a million. So, so we're emulating, in this case, with this hot loop, which is, which is a simple case, we're emulating uh, 746,000 Atari 2600s, effectively. The, the computational power of that um, on one server. Which, I don't know how many Atari, uh, Atari 2600 sales... I just I just like stats. Oh, unit sold thirty million. So, uh, so we're emulating on one server. We're emulating 
2.5% of all the Atari 2600 computational power in the world. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> okay. So now that you've seen kind of the best case when we're doing this like hot loop, um, obviously this is not, this is not like realistic, right? This is, this isn't really a realistic version of, um, if we unrolled more, we'd probably, we'd probably get another like 25% speed up. I don't know. We could, we could just unroll this whole thing. Let's, uh, I just, I just want to try this. I just want to try this because I can. Let's see. So this is, uh, we'll just do a, a DD and then a P. Oops. Uh, 255P. And then if we just put this 255, or actually we'll leave this at 240. So we'll do 240P. Woo! Um, Dex DD 240P. So we now should have 240 of these, which means this should be zero at the end. Uh, branch not equal, so that shouldn't loop. And then we'll just put this uh, track I count in here. We'll get the like. Honestly, we can go up to 255. Oops, 240. Whoops. Whoops, D. 235, and we'll manually DD 255. Actually, we can just do, we don't even need that loop anymore. Yeah, we don't even need that loop. Um, we'll just do Y loop, and then we'll do uh, dex DD 256P. What size operations are, am I doing? 64 bits. So my IL is 64 bit only. Same with the JIT. Um, yes, you could get like another 8x speed up here, um, but that wouldn't be fair because you wouldn't be able to ever do a memory operation in that case. And I'm gonna I'm gonna show you the worst case performance of my IL, um, which will look a lot worse than this. So we have 256 of these. I mean, it doesn't really matter how many dexes we have. We're just doing we're just doing dexes just to, for filler. We'll do a DEY and then a Y loop, and we don't really care about the counts here. Uh, we will need to... I deleted something. Oh, yeah, this is on... Uh, that's going to be up... Uh, 886. Is it this once a ref? Is that it? Is that what you're complaining about? Um, expected an option. Yeah, 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 yeah. Some. Okay. And. Oh. 883. Okay. Uh, yeah, that should be a reference. And that shouldn't be. I was like, that, that makes no sense. I wasn't pre preserving the same semantics. So let's, uh, how do I clear the history here? We'll just start a new calc. So we're gonna get that same, we're gonna get that same kind of operate. Uh, oh, we need to build our, our 6502 application. There we go. Oh, range error. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, dex. 259, not in that range. Uh, I guess we can probably only unroll 128 deep. So we'll do like a D250, D, 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 and we'll do like 120P. That should probably uh, get us in the ballpark. We can close that. Okay. Okay. So this is not going to be our final number because this has the instruction counting, which is slow. Oh boy. Even with instruction counting, this is looking good. Woo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is going to this is going to be effectively what I expect. So now all we have to do is we have to take the instructions per second divided by the fuzz cases per second. 
Okay. And then we'll get rid of the track I count. And then we'll use, then we'll multiply. Um, we'll multiply this by the fuzz cases per second that we're getting now. And then that will give us our, pretty much our best case scenario, 6502 emulation speed, which is not fair. It's like, what we're doing right now is we're finding the best case. We're not looking at the average case. It's gonna, the average case is gonna be catastrophically worse than this. Just, just letting you know. I'm not trying to like fudge results here. We're gonna let that number grow a little bit. Um, so effectively, this, when we're running this code, th this is going to jit out to just ads in a row in AVX 512, which will saturate the processor's maximum throughput for this operation. Like, this, this code is now perfect. There is no optimization that we can do at this point for, for the code that we're emitting anymore. So this is absolute best case. However, the 6502 is almost always doing memory accessy. So the 6502 actually really stresses my JIT and my IL in a way that it wasn't kind of intended. So like, if we think about 64-bit architectures, we have... Um, we have x86 64-bit uh, mode, which has uh, 16 GPRs minus like RBP and RSP, which are pretty much always used, uh, which is about 14 GPRs that are available for use. Uh, MIPS has 32 general purpose registers minus the zero register, the stack register, and usually like one or two are allocated for uh, RIP relative addressing, so like 28 addresses. 6502 only has three addresses which means that almost everything that you do on the 6502 will end up reading and writing to memory. And 8-bit memory operations are the absolute worst performance of my IL. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try and find worst performance numbers in my IL to kind of contrast these things. Um, there's actually an optimization I wanna do on the worst case here too. Uh, if the VM state is likely to be coherent, you could interleave the 8-bit memories uh, in single, uh, you could interleave the 8-bit VM memories on single byte slices, then you could still likely do 8-byte size loads as a single 64-bit load. That is what I what I do right now. Um, so, well, th yes, that that is like literally what I do right now for my MMU implementation, not for that 8-bit operation, but I interleave everything on a 64-bit boundary. And that means when I do loads and stores of 8-bit value, or like an 8-bit load and store, I actually have to find the index of the 64-bit thing that contains it and shift and mask it. And that's why the worst case uh, performance numbers are so bad for my um, uh, one-byte loads and stores. So we're, we're going to look into that uh, now. So... That's been running long enough. We can now take this number and multiply it, and this will give us our uh, billion. This will give us our performance in billion instructions per second, and we're running 906 billion uh, 6502 instructions per second. So this is 906 billion 6502 insters per second. This is best case. This is absolute best case like this isn't even remotely realistic um and then if we multiply that by two because each of these are two cycles we're emulating effectively uh 1.8 terahertz of 6502 execution so so that's uh we're not emulating a one point we're not emulating a 1.8 terahertz 6502 processor that is our like number of 6502 cycles we're doing if we divide this down by 2048 this is uh showing us that we're running um uh we're running 2048 885 megahertz 6502 processors that's what we're emulating right now which is faster than any 6502 hardware by an absolute landslide. I, I think that's probably safe to say. <laughs> so, so this is truly emulating um, 2048, uh, 885 megahertz, 6502 processors. Okay. Uh, 
Could you speculatively re-optimize the JIT based on reasonable assumptions, no exceptions mainly, uh, then track whether those assumptions are violated? So right now we actually optimize across uh, exceptions, um, and then we kind of like unwind and rerun if we do hit an exception. So we're effectively kind of doing that already. Um, not realistic, but still cool. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, not realistic, but still cool because likely to, uh, be equivalent to, or more than the number of act operations actually being executed on the 2600. What do you mean by that? Like if we were to run this on a, a 2600, we would be 800. 885 times faster effective like ballpark um unless you mean like on general purpose code where it's like actually doing memory loads and stores in which case we're gonna we're gonna take a look at that okay okay so uh we're gonna go and turn on track i count and we're, we're going to change our application from that instruction loop to a main function that uh, we're just going to do uh, uint32t val equals 20,000 while val minus minus. Um, I think you can just do that in, in C. So this is just going to be memory accesses everywhere. And we'll see that our performance is going to drop all the way down. Oh, yeah, it's like equal to all of the 2600s. Yeah, yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so this will drop to about 10 billion instructions per second. So even though we were running that magical like our our cap of 906 billion 6502 instructions per second our average case is actually about 10 billion 6502 instructions per second when we factor in um oh uh, let's see i think this is just taking a while to spin up for some reason oh i need to have this uh i need to have this exit um volatile in ox leet is zero that's like writing to leet is my marker for the end of the fuzz case right now uh and we need to rebuild it okay so the code that's going to be generated here is is actually pretty gross um because we're doing a 32-bit thing on a on a 8-bit architecture so this is just meant to like really stress these memory operations here um Come on. I feel like something is not happy on this file right now. Let me uh, check in on it. Yeah, the file is really not happy right now. I don't know if the kernel is like cleaning up memory or something. What is going on on this thing? Uh, PS aux. Oh, you know what? I bet one is running for some reason. Oh my god. Here, I'll just do a uh, kill all 6502 test. Please. Okay. Yeah, I think for some reason the control C didn't end up uh, killing a process, so I had one running. Okay. So, now... This is going to run this like memory heavy version. And this actually is going to emit like a bunch of call stubs and things that kind of gets really gross here. Uh, if I take this test app, we'll throw this in Ida while we're waiting for it to uh, load up. Test, don't save. I don't know why that's taken so long to spin up. I wonder if our optimization pass has like a, an infinite loop. I don't think so. 801, 801.1. Like, for some reason, Linux is struggling to spin up those threads. And I'm not, I'm not sure why. Okay, now they're spawned. Um, 
What's going on here? Something's really wacky. I could potentially have a lifting bug here. So this is generating... Oh, we didn't want to load this at 801. Uh, the Commodore loads things at 801. I'm looking to switch over to the Commodore 64 because it uh, has a little bit more RAM so I can use uh, heap allocations. I think we're putting this one at F is where this is supposed to go. Yeah. So... This is the invocation of main, and here's main here, and it's doing like a bunch of these calls to these functions that are all doing. This is a like a um. This is a 32-bit subtract. I don't even know what that's doing. So the amount of code that's being generated for this loop, this looks like a pretty healthy mix of a lot of of memory loads and stores, um, and that's a good worst case. I don't know. Let me put one thread on. Let's see. What's up, MetaConstruct? How are you doing today? Okay. Is that loop just too small? Um, while val minus minus. That loop shouldn't be too small. We'll just do while val, val minus minus. Put that to 200,000. I don't, I don't know why that is uh, completing execution so fast. Oh, you know what? I think this is faulting in a different way. It is. It's definitely faulting in a different way. So let's do... Hey, Met and Pissa, uh, Pissa and you know each other? That's pretty cool. Small world indeed. We're going to print the exit code. I'm guessing this is faulting on some other memory access, and I'm, I'm not quite sure why here. Oops, and we'll need to build this uh, here. Oh, technically we didn't need to need to build that so this is going to tell us why it's faulting for some reason it's like faulting on something else did gamecube hacking what kind of stuff did you do that sounds really interesting i've never i've never done uh game console stuff i've only done uh i installed like a mod chip in my brother's wii in high school that was that was really fun but like that's not really game console hacking <laughs> what kind of stuff do you do that's cool Okay, MMU fault. Ooh. Is our optimization pass not sane? Whoa. Whoa. I bet if we disable our optimization pass, that will fix it. The new optimization pass. Um, uh huh. Is there is there a bug in her optimization pass? Hacking games and consoles? Like speedrunning stuff or like trying to get arbitrary code execution in a game? Yeah, there's a bug in that optimization pass. Is this not always safe? Okay. Isler created, get the mappings, add sub and or XOR shift left. Oh, maybe if it's, uh, I bet it's, it's the shift case. I think the shift. Is that it? Is the, the shift case should be fine. Oh, yep, there's a bug. There's a bug in this optimization pass. Um, what we need to do is we need to make sure that there's no other usage of the IL register output between between the zero extension. So the the case here, and that's interesting because I actually had this in my mind when I was writing the optimization pass and forgot. So if we look at if we do like 
val is equal to x plus y, val is equal to zero extend uh, x uh, or val um, eight, and then we were to do a uh, val equals uh, val plus y, and then val equals zero extend val eight. We've decided that we can remove that, which is true, but we cannot remove it if the uh, there's like a mem read of val, like if someone else uses that memory, or if someone else uses that that uh, intermediate value. So we need to make sure that the only users of that value are arithmetic. Um, so that should be pretty interesting. Uh, didn't we do another thing? Fail at ace on SMB. I uh, didn't on F0GX, messing with the uh, GameCube and Wii, tool assisted speedrunning. That's so fucking cool. I'm definitely going to check this out. Let me, uh, let me. Oh, is this you guys at, uh, what are you guys, are you guys behind Taskbot? Or is this the, the run you did? Man. Man, this is so cool. Work with the person. This is so cool. Congrats to you guys. This is amazing. How cool is that? Whoa, what was that? <laughs> wow, I'm gonna I'm gonna watch this whole thing uh uh in a bit. That's so cool. Reverse engineered the replay format. Oh my gosh. Man, that is so cool. Congratulations. I I love the Taskbot segments. Like, uh, I don't know if you guys know uh, Jordan or Rusty, but I, I used to work with them uh, who work on Binary Ninja. So that's like, that's so cool. All right. Uh, if is arithmetic instruction. Okay, that's fine. All that matters is the u the extend output. I need to look through all usages of this and all usages arithmetic equals ooh they all have to be arithmetic and they all have to zero extend in the same way. Um Okay. Let mute all sane is equal to true. So uh, check if all of the usages of this zero, uh, extended output will get further zero extended of the same type. So check if all usages of this extended output will get that. So we're going to look up ILR use. Um, then we're going to look up the usages of it. Um, all seen. And then if it's not arithmetic, so if someone uses it and it's not arithmetic, all seen is equal to false. Um, and then in that case, we just continue to uh, next inst. We want to find a new, actually, yeah, the continue in this case will be, um, find another extension. Uh, there's not a great way to format this, is there? I love debugging these things. Um, okay. So, we're going to go through every instruction. We're going to start on arithmetic only. We're going to get the output. We're then going to look for all usages of the output. Then they need to be extensions. If it's not an extension, we go to the we go to the next one here. That continue was technically fine, but I, it just makes it a little bit more verbose and understandable in the code. Um, so then we're going to check. Uh, we're going to get extended outputs. So now this is our optimization candidate. Uh, this is our optimization candidate. So now we want to see if all the usage of this extended output will get further zero extended of the same type and only are used by arithmetic instructions. 
So we're going to go through um, Okay. So go through the usages. Then for that in usage inst under two usages dot iter. Uh, skip non arithmetic. If one is not arithmetic, then all sane is equal to false, and then we can go to the we can go to this. We don't have to iterate again because the sanity has been broken. Um, in fact, we don't even need that. We just have to be very careful with our continues. So if it's not arithmetic, then we go to find another extension. So if any usage of this is not arithmetic, boop, fail. Then if the next usage of that thing is not arithmetic, so... Okay, if the, uh, okay, then if, uh, make sure it's also extended, make sure it's the same type of extension, hopefully I can put a new line here, I don't know if I can, oh, I can't even, it doesn't even fit there, uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. No. We're gonna, do, we're gonna do this. It's kind of gross. I know. I know. I know. I know it's gross. I'm not happy about it either. Here, this will do this. Okay. And then queue up that and and break done. We don't actually want to do this yet. Um, we'll keep this commented out and we'll make nothing subject for removal right now. Okay. And then we're going to go back to our original example. This will, this will make it use the assembly main routine instead of this, just kind of a hack. Um, okay. So now what we should be able to do is at the end of this loop, uh, print, if we got here, we can remove the extension. Okay. Um, yeah, and actually we can, I think we can just do this. Um, okay. So at this point, we know that we're extending an arithmetic operation. We then look for all uses and we make sure that every single usage of that extended output is an arithmetic operation. If it is not, then we go up to this part of the loop and we never make it down to the optimization path. Then we'll look at all usage usages of the arithmetic and we'll make sure that they get extended again. Um, if it's not an extension operation used by that, we go to the next extension. Otherwise, uh, if it's not equal to that, then find another extension, find another extension, find another extension. Finally, at the end, at this point, we know that the uh, zero or that the extended value, the extended output is only ever used by arithmetic and in all uses and after that arithmet arithmetic in all cases, it gets zero, uh, it gets extended again, of the same type and size. So, uh, okay. I think this is now correct. So we still should see the same good performance where we'll get the like 500 billion in instructions per second, but this is a lot stricter. Okay, yep. So that should be good. And then we can get rid of this print temporarily. Okay. So now, now we only ever optimize things in that case. Uh, and then here we can do a, a break. Um, we want to do a break here, uh, break done. Okay. Does that make sense? All usages of this 
are arithmetic and all usages of that are sine extension. And you might be thinking, what if this is an extend of an extend? Well, you have another optimization pass that will take care of that for us. Okay, now we can spin up our threads. And I think we're good. I think our optimization pass still works in this case, this like chained extension case. Um, yeah, it's definitely optimized. But now it should work when we put this back into normal mode. This will no longer hit that weird fault case. This, this, this is now correct because it won't optimize things that could get passed potentially to like a memory load or a store. Um, and we'll put a print on the... Uh, uh, We'll put this print back in temporarily, just to see. But these should be crashing on a elite axis. I'll make this hex as well. Okay. Uh, and I think it's running on the server again. Uh, Htop. Okay, server's quiet. Everything's good. Copied out. Okay. Oh, now we're getting a fault there. Oh, man. Is this still not right? What would it be removing? So, if it's not arithmetic, continue. Find usages of this output. And then we replace extend output with a ridge output. If some usages get the extended output. There, there's another edge case that I'm missing here then. Um, get that. Do I not like continue in some case? If it's not arithmetic, continue check all these maybe it's if it's not used in these patterns this might be happening in an earlier stage of the optimization um, so in these if lets I think these if lets are hurting us so what we're gonna do is on the else cases of the if lets we won't optimize so in this case um, no usages don't optimize okay and then in this case this other iflet, okay. Then we have an iflet here as well. Else, no usages, don't optimize. And maybe this is it? So at this point, there has to be at least one use, and we verify all the usages. What is going on? So there's something that we're optimizing... If it's not arithmetic, if it's not extension, false, okay. Go through all of these. Oh, it's because we filter it here. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay. Because we already were filtering it there. So we would never see a usage in another situation. Oh my gosh. I was like, I'm pretty sure that logic is sound in all cases. Okay, so now we record all usages. Um, and this is now correct. Yeah. Now they're only faulting on accessing elite, which is good. Okay. Okay. Whew. Go through each block, accumulate where they're used and where they're output. Okay. Now this is correct. So now it only optimizes things with that access pattern uh, with no other uses. So Okay, and are we running single threaded right now? No, we're not. Okay. Uh, one second, I need to... Okay.
Okay. So this is kind of like exactly what I expected, about 10 billion instructions per second when we're doing memory loads and stores. And that's because memory loads are very slow operations in my IL uh, or in my JIT. And specifically in this case, they are catastrophically bad because... Um, Um, in this case, they're like catastrophically bad uh, because the I'm actually emulating a 64-bit address space. And let's see here. Okay. So if I look at the MMU, which I do actually have open, we're using a five-level page table with... Uh, and we're translating all of the... ad Like we're... Like, this is just, this, this address translation is just pretty brutal. We're going to set this to, like, page size, and then we'll set this to, like, 8. We're going to see if this changes perf at all. Uh, this will change, like, the shape of the page table. Aren't memory loads in stores slow in general? Yeah, in this case, it's, like, catastrophically slow because um, it's actually going to... Uh, because I have a soft MMU, and I'm using a 64-bit address space to emulate a 6502, which does a 16-bit address space. So I'm performing, like, a five-level page table when... Uh, actually, I'm using a four-level page table. One, two, three, four-level page table. This is the page size. Um, so I'm using a four-level page table to translate 16-bit addresses, which is just so overkill. Um... Okay, and okay, that looks good. And now I'm going to take a look at, so what I want to implement is I want to implement skip levels. Yeah, oh, it's so much overhead. I'm, I'm emulating an address space that is larger than the like 64-bit x86 address space. Um, no skip levels supported. Uh, okay. Good. So we are now going to add skip levels. Is soft MMU a generic term for uh, emulating an MMU? Yeah, pretty much. That's pretty standard. I think, like, uh, you'll find, like, soft MMU. I think they'll, like, in QMU, they'll call it a soft MMU. Yeah. Sorry, I've got some, like, chats coming up here. Um, okay. So, yeah, I think QMU calls it a soft MMU as well. So, yep, I think it's just generic for, like, an emulated uh, address space, pretty much. Or, emu yeah. Okay, so number of levels in the page table. Okay, and then we'll do const page table skip. And this is the uh, number of bits at the top of the address. Number of bits at the top of the address that will be ignored during translation. And we're going to set this. If it's zero, that's going to need to be valid. And what we'll do is we'll make sure that page table skip uh, 16, 16, that's 48. So we can make a, a two-level page table. Um, I think, yeah, it always has to have two. We must have at least one level of page table translation. We could relax that even more as well. Uh, so here we'll say page table skip. Um, this must be equal to the first uh, entry in page table layout. Um or zero. And we'll actually make this an option. Just so it's like more clear. Or none. Okay. Yep. And then this we just have to set to three. Page table depth is that. Okay. 
Obviously, that's not being used yet. And then we're going to go into MMU. Okay. Uh, deploy. Okay, of course that's going to fail because um, it's trying to allocate a 48-bit first-level page table. So now I think I need to look at every single reference of page table depth or how do you do an or for like full word size thing? Uh, vim regex or two words. Um, I always forget how to do this. That. Yeah. Uh, that begins the start. Is it just that? Is that the only way to do it? That's kind of gross. Um, does that does that work? No. What? Oh, I need to also this. Hey, okay. You'd get a good speed bump if you uh, lifted like the zero page to registers. Yeah, that could actually work. Um, and I know that the zero page is always mapped read write. Um, but that would kind of that would make some of the lifting really weird. I would have to statically know it's in the zero page. I guess I do. Um, okay. So page table depth is that. Okay, good. And page size is equal to the last element, so we haven't affected that. A master use on the bottom address to find the bits. Okay, yep. Page table layout, okay. Maybe I don't have that. Maybe I get rid of maybe I get rid of this, actually. Um and that needs to be two entries, which should be fine. Uh, we'll say this. Um, okay. Now, this will fail. Like, all this stuff, invalid page table shape. Yep. Okay, so here we'll do C bits. And then we'll do... Uh, uh, we'll do C bits as U size plus... This is when we're creating it, so we're just sanity checking the um, configuration of the page table shape. So we're making sure that the user has specified a valid uh, shape for this page table. So page table skip, and this will do dot uh, unwrap or zero. So now it won't fail, but now like all the um, yeah attempted to dedupe memory at already mapped memory. Oh yeah, these tests. We might need to give this a larger address space for the tests, but then when we actually go, the the tests I think use a, a larger address, so we'll we'll just do like this, um, and we'll set this to three. We'll move this down because it makes more sense to put it right next to it, and then this we'll just do thirty two. And I think I use thirty two bit addresses in my um, tests. Okay, attempted to add memory that already exists, and I think this is fine because that's just the translation is now incorrect, but. Uh, the test virtual address. Um, ooh. Uh, I think that's. Oh, I do use a sixty-four bit one. We'll we'll do uh we'll do like. How big of an offset do we apply to this? Page size times four. Um. We can probably just do like. Uh, We'll just do this. Okay. Okay, so then if we have the skip, obviously that's uh, got exception there. Oop, vatter. Test virtual address. I just need to make sure our, te our tests, I think, assume a 64 bit adder space. So I just need to make sure that these all. Um, actually, that's going to be in, is that in a different one? Got exception there. Did not include, ex okay. Uh, 
Okay, and then this should be... Okay. Okay, uh, assertion failed that it wasn't equal to the page size. Yeah, because none of this stuff is going to be correct right now. So I should be able to set this to zero or none, and then put this to 32, or 1616, and then this should correctly, uh, the test should pass here. I just want to make sure everything is like working as I expect. Okay, everything looks good here. Um, um, Okay, some of these tests are pretty long, but these tests are critical. Without these tests, this MMU code is so complex, uh, I, I need to have those, those heavy tests. So now we're going to switch to a three-level table, and then we'll have a 32 skip. If we have like 31 here, this should panic when we go to create the MMU. Or MMU. Yep, Didn't, uh, like invalid shape. This is now a valid shape. And then all I need to do is, I think, on my translations. Um, basically, I think anywhere where I use page table layout. Recursive drop. That's fine. That's fine out of the box. Uh, uh, safely compute. Okay, yep. And then here, this is invert to fizz. And I think this is the only location where we actually have to do that. Um, do, do, yeah, okay, perfect. So up here, all we're going to need to do is we're going to need to uh, uh, rotate left that shift. So here we'll do vatter is equal to vatter dot rotate left of the uh, page table skip dot unwrap or zero. So then uh, rotate out the top bits we don't care about. So rotate left, page table skip, um, unwrap or zero. I think that should just literally just work. Uh, that needs to be a U32, not a big deal. So the MMU test will fail, but the local test should succeed because that changed everything for the local test and we're just gonna have to modify this in the JIT. So the JIT's also going to have to use that correctly. So MMU source and AVX512 JIT. In this case, when we, in our translation down here, where we do our rotate left, we need to just do the same thing here. Um, so it'll be uh, rotate off the bits that we ignore at the top of the address. So rotate left by page table skip dot unwrap or zero as I 64. So that's gonna work uh, for, okay, just create, yep. Uh, page table skip. So that's only gonna fix it for the scalar case. So rotate left by the page table skip. Yep, and then down here, uh, I'm, I just remembered in my head that this should be a checked ad. Um, and we're going to put this on a new line. And this is going to be like, let uh, C bits. Do we use that anywhere else? No, we don't. It's just there. So we'll do a, we'll reassign it. It's equal to this dot checked ad. Um, checked ad this dot expect uh, integer overflow on page table skip. Hey, Wisp, how's it going? Are you just chatting? That's what we do here. We just kind of talk while we write code. Okay, C bits is equal to that. Uh, page table skip, unwrap or zero. Okay, so this will work in the uh, non-divergent MMU cases, which I don't think I have a test for. So we should be fine. We're going to go into in our JIT where we use the page table skip. Um, 
Why are you in just chatting? I mean, we're just chatting. Science and technology is just a dead category. So that's kind of why I don't use that. But yes, it, it does make sense. Both of them make sense in this case, and uh, just chatting is the bigger category here. So I kind of just went with that. Like, if you go to just chatting, which will always be at the top of Twitch, you'll be able to scroll through and find the stream, and people might find this interesting and join. And I do see that about 10% of my viewers got here through browsing on the Twitch sections. When I, when I do streams on science and technology, it drops to about 1% or 2%. Uh, basically, no one looks through the science and technology category, so I like to keep it on the just chatting category. And since I'm literally just chatting and, and writing code, it's not like I'm, I'm lying about what I'm doing. It's, it's still accurate to the category. So it's just, a, it's just a small optimization, kind of. Okay, so that is on uh, VP roll VQ. Okay, so this is the page table walk. We're going to do the same thing here. So we have the uh, address in ZMM1, uh, kmask. We're just implementing the exact same thing here. Uh, VP roll VQ, VREG ZMM1, kmask. And then we're going to do a CS broadcast of this value. Unwrap or that. I don't. I think I actually have that take U size. Uh, expected U64. Okay. We can make that work. CS broadcast. Uh, that as a U64. Oops. Okay. Page table skip, unwrap, or that. Convert it to U64, which is fine. Uh, rotate left, quadward. So I think this is now correct. Ooh, it's not. Uh, that's the broadcasted page table base. Page table skip. Vector packed, rotate left, variable quadward. Vreg ZMM1, Kmask, page table skip. Um, I could also make these not use... Uh, uh, broadcast things, and that would give me a speed up as well. Um, bench MMU JIT failed. I'm curious how those are failing. Whoa. I'm surprised that was able to assemble because I didn't have another operand in here. Okay. So ZMM1, uh, rotate left by that. Test MMU JIT failed. Okay. Why is that? I think we can just rotate that left. Um, hmm. We'll do a uh, GVIM deploy or VIM deploy, and we'll set this to. Uh, no capture. Let's see if we can see the reason why that's failing. Is that not in the right spot? Um. Oh, that was the wrong line. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Assertion failed. Fault is uh, equal to cause beam exit. Okay, got exception. That one's good. Uh, different reads. Content mismatch on mask. Vectored packed. Rotate left. Variable quad word. Get the ZMM1, which I think has the address. Let me see. Is that implied? Oh, that's an MMU access? Wait, 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 wait.
No, that's doing the page table walk. This is in the... Yeah, that's in the translate function. Um, ZMM1. And Q with that. A perm. Is it expected that it's always in ZMM? Wait, how does it get in ZMM1? And quad word address. Okay, so we get, uh, we align it down. Oh, I think I just want to do it at the start. I think it would make more sense to just unconditionally do it at the start rather than when I actually go to do the page table walk. Yep, that would make sense because in certain situations that would... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, 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 yep. That makes sense. Uh, roll. Okay. So now this shouldn't have any page table skip. Good. Then uh, we want the first use of ZMM1, which is going to be on that mask calculation here. Uh, how do you get here? Okay, in this case, we just are... We got the address into ZMM1, ZMM1, ZMM1. So then down here, check if the permission, oh, that's an access. Okay. So that uses address. Oh. Well, that's the issue. Okay, we can we can put that back in, but this is going to now work on. Uh, this will work on adder. Yeah, but that's gonna use. It wants that to be constant. Uh, we can just add it in our shift sum. Uh, shift sum plus equals that. Shift is that. Shift sum starts out at, at three. Okay, plus the page table skip, unwrap or zero as U64. And then the rotate left, we wanna keep that. Uh, rotate those so we skip them. RCX. Contains that address. Okay. I think we did it. Okay, and we're going to get rid of the no capture. What are you working on right now? Uh, right now we're working on a, a JIT, uh, like a super fast uh, 6502 emulator. And we're just, oh, we're just fixing, we're actually making some performance improvements. So I was just in there changing the page table walk to make it not walk as big of a page table so it doesn't emulate a 64-bit address space. Um, and basically, uh, the 6502 only has a 16-bit address space, and we were emulating it as if it had a 64-bit address space, which made our memory loads and stores very, 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 very expensive when they didn't need to be. Um, so now that we've kind of fixed that, we're going, um, we're going to see what this uh, benchmark is benchmarks at. So I'm just waiting for this test to complete um, to make sure everything looks correct and that we implemented these skip levels correctly. And then we're going to switch to a very small page table for uh, the 6502. Um, and then hopefully we're going to get uh, more performance. Yep. Bench MMU JIT has been running for over 60 seconds. That's fine. Um, so that's Yeah, it's doing 100 mil iterations there. I don't remember how long this benchmark takes, um, but it looks like all the other tests have passed, so I think we're fine at this point. Okay, so I'm going to drop this down by two. This should make it 100 times faster to run this test. Uh, the benchmarking one isn't actually validating anything, so... Yeah, that's not actually doing any anything there. 
uh, bench MMU jit. That one always is supposed to panic intentionally because it tells you um, the cost of these operations. So now this means that what we can do is we can play with the page table sizes. Um, what is the emulator for? It's just the 6502 processor. Nothing in particular here. Um, okay, so this is telling us the translation times and the access times. So you'll see that a one byte read uh, without divergent costs without divergence costs us 30 cycles uh, to translate and eight cycles to access, which means that when you add those two together, that's the cost of every single operation. Um, but yeah, we're just writing a 6502 processor emulator. Uh, we're not emulating any hardware specifically, just the processor. Okay, so that's bench MMU JIT. Benchmark, uh, num tests. Um, actually, I want to look at the bench MMU JIT. And that uses test vatter. And test vatter comes from tests, which is here. This is too low level. Nothing's too low level for anyone. We're just having fun here. Okay, so I want to change this to use a smaller uh, test size, maybe. We're going to try this. And this means we should be able to test the oh, test exception handler. Uh-oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, test exception handler. That has a hard-coded string. Um, this should be, uh, what do we call it, 1300 test batter? 37, yep. So this is now fine. That'll fix that. And then now we can do much smaller. Oops. You know, we'll keep it at, at this. Um, and we'll just ignore that test failure for that case. Okay. Bench MMU JIT, that failed, looks good. And then we'll just see, now we see the performance. Yeah, the 30 and nine. And we can see how much slower it is when we have no skip level. So we'll get rid of the skip level. And then that means we'll put another two levels in this page table here. And this will uh, allow us to see how that affected performance. So it, it was 30 and, and nine, and now let's see what this turns into. Uh, now it's 39 and nine. Um, and then these worst cases got quite a bit worse. So when I switch to this mode, uh, this is no longer gonna, some of the other tests are gonna fail. Um, uh, yep, and uh, it caught me. So we'll say we'll ignore the top 48 bits of the address. And bench MMU JIT. So now we'll actually see the, the perf of the, the benchmark now. And now it's 28 and 11. Um, I guess that's about as good as we're going to get. We could... Um, like, I don't think I can do this. I don't think it allows me to have a zero size uh, page table. I don't think so. We're, we're going to see if we get uh, perf results for this. Obviously, all the tests are failing. Okay. Yeah, we're going to set this to a 1-bit and then a 15-bit here. This might be kind of the best performance we can get. Ooh. 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 Why are those failing? Oh, yeah, because that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's the... um. I really do want to make this a 16-bit thing. Uh... I think if I just do zero, I might be fine here. Test virtual address here. Test virtual address. I 
how much are we actually adding for memory? Page size there, just doing page size. I don't think we actually like use that much memory on these. So test virtual address, test virtual address, we'll put it at 10. And then I think all the tests don't, uh, basically the problem is this, I don't know if my tests work on an address space of a 16 bit address space. Uh, D dupe working. Okay, page size, blah, blah, blah. Why are those not working? I never really tested it at this level of, of page table entries. Uh, failed. Uh, partial page deduping not allowed. Oh, yeah, because these, these might care about... Yeah, so these tests aren't going to work unless I have, like, a, a page size of, like, probably, like, three. That's an issue of, like, the test. Actually, probably two might, might be fine here. Um, that's just the tests. Okay, mm, we'll go to four. I'll put us at 12. Oh, okay. Content mismatch on mask. Ooh. Attempted to immediately reference alias memory. I don't think those are real failures. I think that's just due to the tiny address space. Let's take a look. Uh, test exception handler. Yep, this just is looking for... Tenth or a thousand now, and then we have non cow dedupe, and I think this makes some assumptions about the page size. Create soft when you get an address, add deduplicated memory, uh, page size, vert to fizz. Okay, and I'll just run the tests manually here. No capture, and then we'll do uh, export rust backtrace is equal to one. Uh, and then I think there's a way to set threads. Yeah, test threads equals one. That's just so we don't end up getting multiple copies. So the first issue, that's in bench. So we want to ignore that. How do we ignore a single test? Um, uh, do, 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 do. We can just put an ignore on the uh, benchmark. But if we look at the benchmarks, what are we getting? 26 and 9. Yeah, that looks pretty good. So, uh, bench. Just put an ignore on this. And then that test will only be run. Uh, we'll need to redeploy. Okay. Take a look. Test and MMUJIT. As long as test and MMUJIT succeeds, then I think we're fine. Uh, I think the other tests just make some weird assumptions about the bit sizing. Okay, so we have one failure. And that's failing in test exception handler, test main. Uh, where is that? Catch unwind in write in vert to fizz int. Vert to fizz int. Got exception at that. Okay, that one's actually not a real failure. That one's meant to panic. That's a that's a test to make sure something does panic. This one's the one that is weird. Mutable non-cow dedupe memory. Oh, that one also passed. Oh, maybe they are all passing. I think no capture might have just been throwing me off. Uh, yep, everything looks good here. Okay. We'll just let the AVX ones pass, and we'll we'll see if that if those look correct. All right, that would make a lot of sense. So that page table size looks good. 
And now we can see what our, our performance is going to go to. It was, it was 10 billion instructions per second. And now that probably will jump up. Uh, do, do, do. Once these complete. What other tests is it running? I'm not sure. 24 tests. It's close to like having all of them done. Validate set permissions. Ooh. Are those getting stuck? Oh, that might be because the page table size is large. I think if we do eight and eight, this, sh this should be fine. I think those tests will just take longer based on the size of the um, page size. So the larger the page size there, the longer those tests take. So... Okay, all the tests pass, perfect. So we definitely implemented that correctly, so we can, we can close these out. And now we can run our actual code. We can go back to 6502 test, deploy this, and we can see what our performance is in this case. So it was 10, mil before, or 10 billion instructions per second before, and now hopefully it's probably a little bit higher. I'm guessing it's probably gonna be like 14 or 15 billion instructions per second. Uh, which isn't a huge improvement, um, but hey, we'll take the wins that we can. Yeah, it looks like uh, 14, just right in that range. I mean, that's still a 40% speed up. Maybe they'll actually climb up to 15 once it kind of se uh, settles in more. Um, make sure all threads are online here. I think they are. Yep, all threads are online. So 15 billion, so a 50% speed up. I'm happy with that. So that means we're just skipping and, and doing like a faster translation. Now, uh, what I really need is a TLB that would allow the translations to uh, be skipped because as you saw in those benchmarks, the translations were like, let's say 40 cycles and an access was 10 cycles. So if somehow we can do a TLB lookup really quickly, we could potentially get like we could probably get this to maybe like 30 billion instructions per second. So at the end of the day, this is what we're effectively looking at is the worst case performance of this JIT. Uh, so these are, um, so we see that we're getting 15 billion per second in this. I actually have an aisle bench test. Oops. Um, uh, CD aisle bench. Let's make sure this still builds. I think I changed some like things here. Yeah, I can't register here. Sign extend. Okay, I, I, I changed a couple things. Um, oh, this pulls in MIPS. It, it shouldn't. This should not. Uh, this doesn't depend on MIPS. And that will fix that issue. And then we just have this in the uh, source main dot dot slash aisle bench oops uh, aisle bench okay so this the only thing that's changed is I created another register the icon register so when you create an architecture you have to specify an icon register uh, in this case we'll say register icon And then we'll say const i count reg register is equal to register i count. Okay. Okay, so that has no instruction counts, no surprise. So this is like benchmarking the aisle by, by writing stuff kind of manually. Um, and what this is going to allow us to do is we can kind of write some theoretical benchmarks. Um, so requesting a lift of that, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna have this. We're gonna load an immediate. So we're gonna test the indirect branch. So the slow operations in our IL, in, in basically in order, the slowest operations, we have uh, slow, 
uh, slowest and then fastest at the end, and we'll have like 8 bit um, divergent memory reads. We'll have 8 bit memory, uh, or er, we'll just say divergent memory reads, um, non 64 bit even worse. Then we're gonna have uh, memory reads. Once again, the non 64 bit. So 64 bit is always going to be the fastest memory accesses. So we'll say like, uh, we'll say 64 bit, 64 bit. And then here we'll say 8, 16, 32 bit divergent memory reads. And then here, uh, actually memory writes are technically slower. And the reads are going to be in, like, here. And so the reads will just be slightly faster, but they won't, like, jump to a different level. Uh, and I think a 64-bit memory write, yeah, that'll still be slower than a 32-bit memory read. Divergent indirect branch be the slowest? Yeah, I mean, that's that's just, like... That's just like factored in like if if you're diverging then you're like dropping off VMs. So I don't really care about that because the that just changes the multiplier of how many VMs you're running, which is a linear uh, performance thing. So if I know the slowest case, then I know that a divergent um, branch would just mean that someone get disabled, but this number still is the fastest that I can do operations in that situation, if that makes sense. So like, divergence just changes the number of VMs that are running. D branch divergence changes the number of VMs that are running. This just gives me kind of an overall cost of these operations. Um, so I can estimate in my head how much divergent branches cost, if that, mean, if that makes sense. Like, I know how much that costs. It's a constant cost. Um, Next, we're going to have, after all of these, we're going to have a pretty branch, uh, a branch indirect, followed by a branch conditional. So this is going to be, a uh, branch indirect is expensive because I have to look up where I want to branch to in a table. Um, and then this is similar, but I actually don't have to look up in a table, but I still have to figure out if I need to mask off VMs. And then everything else from this point is like, negligible cost. This is like all the arithmetics and like uh, set conditionals. Um, like these just, these are, these are free. These will, these operations will run in that like 500 billion plus range. Uh, this will probably run in like 10 billion plus range. I'm not sure. So I'm going to load... I'm going to reg read A. I'm going to reg read A. Graph dot M aisle word zero. Let zero is equal to this. We're going to say let A. If A is on side less than zero, then we go to, uh, like we're going to call this, uh, main block and then we're gonna have an end block here that we'll have to create and block alloc label so main block so if it's less than that uh we actually might need to make like a, a loop counter here because we want this to exit at some point yeah i think we need this to exit i don't think we update statistics until an exit occurs so I'll get the main block, we'll get the end block. Uh, we'll get the A register, we'll get zero, we'll get uh, 100,000. We'll call this HT, and then we'll get one. This will be graph dot uh, immediate. Uh, we probably should just grab that. This one, then we'll do uh, let a is equal to graph dot add a with one. If that is unsigned less than 
100,000. We'll also write out this register. I'll write out A. So A, we're going to load that. Take that, add one, reg write. Problem is this is not just benchmarking the branch conditional, but it's close. Uh, end under block. And then this, we just have to say uh, graph.branch main block. So we first branch to the main block. And this also. Oops. Uh, label. Uh, dot push label. Uh, and this too. Push label main block. Okay. So this should run. Yep, that runs just fine. Uh, if that is less than that, go to the main block. Really? Is that running that fast? If I make that, will that drop fuzz cases per second? No. I've got a bug here. Reg read A, get one, add that. We're going to check if this is unsigned less than HT, 100,000. It's not 100,000 anymore. If it's less than that, then we go to the main block. Otherwise, we go to the end block. Uh, branch to the main block. I feel like that's right. What? This should not be running this fast. Um, A1. A, write it. One ten less than HT. Reg read A. Oh, uh, maybe I. Oh, I set A. Yeah, I set A to uh, already greater than that. Yep, yep, yep. Set reg zero online. Set reg online. A to zero. It's about to say, like, that made no sense. Okay. So those numbers look good. Nice and healthy. Now, I just want to... I really just want this to, like, branch conditional in, like, a loop. I mean, that's, that's what this is doing, but I don't want it to count, even. Um... Branch conditional. How would I do that? Like, this is the fastest way that I can loop and count that. Uh, yeah. I don't know. So then, then we can update the instruction count. We'll do uh, I count. We'll steal this code. Uh, where is that? Oh, here. If track I count. So we'll just say that this is our instruction, is each time we do one of these operations. We'll just say if true. So now we have like a, an instruction count where each instruction is this like increment and conditional branch. Yeah, this is running 50 billion per second, 60 billion per second. Probably I would say like 75 when that converges. Um, so our our uh, our conditional branches are are not that expensive, um, because we're still doing a bunch of stuff in here too. Like these probably add up to like, it's you can probably do like a hundred billion of these a second, um. So this is also affecting, like logging the eye counts is actually causing a slowdown as well. So let's just do what we did before. Uh, we're going to grab the calculator app. Uh, we're going to take that number and divide it by the fuzz cases per second. And then we're going to run it again. Okay. So now it's probably going to be in the thousand range for fuzz cases per second.
Okay, so now we can take this, multiply it by our fuzz cases per second. It's probably going to climb to 1,000, but this is fine. So we're getting 100 billion of these quote-unquote instructions per second. So that's not very slow at all. So then I can load... Um, okay, so let's just make note of that. And I'm going to say it's like 125 billion because the adding and the like loop like this overhead of terminating the loop actually is a uh, non-zero cost. So, uh, where is that thing? So we're gonna say that this is about, let's say like 120 billion insters. Okay, so then, Uh, then we have branch indirect. So I think branch indirect, what's the best way to do this? I can load up this and I can just do like graph dot branch indirect to HT. That's going to make an infinite loop. Uh, it's just going to like keep looping through this code. Um, so sadly I don't get like if I'm doing an indirect branch, I'm going to need to do that same logic in like a really weird way. Um, how do I do this? So I can regrate that and then I can make a... I can do like a graph dot... Uh, uh, I can do graph dot like set cond based on this. That'll give me a mask is equal to this, and then uh, we'll say like that'll get a lifting of zero eventually. So then we're gonna do let target is equal to graph dot m word. Okay, so then we're gonna say that. Uh, and we'll do a let target is equal to graph dot and mask with target, and then we'll branch indirectly to target. So this should now give that loop uh, set con is one word, I guess. I should probably change that. I keep typing it with an underscore, which means that that's what I find more natural. So we should see a requesting of lifting of zero, maybe? Um, if that is unsigned less than that, oh, it might just be that much slower. Let's just see what, it, what this does. Okay, requesting lifting of zero. So I'll say if PC is equal to vert adder zero, then what we're going to lift is a trap dead return. Uh, return OK. So if it's requesting that, then we return that. So now this should, yep, OK. And then we're just going to set uh, this to true so we can get an instruction count. So this is probably going to be much worse. This will probably be in the, like, the 20 billion range. Yep. I like that I have a rough idea of how expensive these operations are. Even though I don't know what they are. That's, man, I love having a good hunch. Okay. So we're going to take this, divide it by this. We'll get rid of this. This will then probably give us a 20% speed up. And then we're just going to say that this probably also has another like 30% overhead. And we'll just fudge, fudge those numbers approximately. I'm going to call this 300,000. Um, oops. Uh, we want this multiplied by 300,000. Okay, so that's 30 mil. And we're just going to say we're going to add like another uh, 1.2, uh, like 25%. We'll say 40, about 40 billion uh, insert per second. Okay. 
So now I really don't care about the divergent reason rights because I can, I can, for, I can figure out what all those are based on these. So the only one that we're gonna benchmark is gonna be the uh, we're gonna do eight bit rights, and we're gonna go back to this the branch conditional one, and uh, let's make sure this works. Does okay. Okay. Um, okay, so we have 40 billion there, and now we're going to, uh, okay, reg read A, get one, get that, and then we're just going to have a memory write in here, draft.memwrite8. Uh, we can just write to... Uh, we'll write to one, and we'll write a one to one. G good enough. And then we're gonna unroll this uh, four and zero dot dot. Let's say uh, sixty four. So the reason I want to unroll that is that will eliminate computing kind of the overhead of all of this stuff. And then here, this I count, we're actually not gonna add one. We're gonna add uh, we're gonna add sixty four. So this will track the number of mem writes we did, and now the overhead of this won't really matter because we're unrolling that so deep. Um, and that's obviously failing. We need to add some memory. Uh, we'll add some memory at zero. I don't know, four bytes, and then uh, uh, set permissions. Okay, so this is effectively what we need to do here. We're just gonna map in uh, at zero. We're gonna map in uh, 100 bytes. I mean, technically, we can map in one, 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 perm read write. So now we have read read writable memory in that one byte location. Uh, attempted to add memory that already exists. Uh, ha, 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 ha. Oh, that also, since we're wrapping that address space, um, we don't actually need to add that memory there. So, okay. So this is going to be really slow. So we're going to just drop this uh, iteration count down. All right, and there's the 15 billion number. Um, not too surprised. It'll actually probably climb up to 20 billion. So, and we could unroll even more to make sure that this definitely is not impacting the benchmark. Uh, Okay, so this will very accurately be giving us an idea of our 8-byte write operation that is non-divergent. The divergent uh, write I can derive from this performance, basically. So this is saying we can do, uh, I don't know, I'll call it like 18 billion per second. And I'm very happy with that. I'm, I'm just happy with that. That's, that's pretty good. Um... It's actually probably more like 18.5 billion per second. And we can take a look at uh, we can take a look at the 64-bit ones, see how much faster those are. Memrite 64. And in this case, we're gonna have to uh, let adder is equal to graph dot uh, m IL word zero. And we'll write a two adder. We'll just write a one. And here we'll just have to map in eight bytes now. So zero to eight bytes. Okay. So this will now give us a 64 byte uh, or a 64 bit performance. And this will probably be uh, significantly better. Maybe it's not that much better. I guess it's only like a couple masks in there that kind of change. So it's not a huge difference. Okay, so that's looking like 21 billion. So it is faster as I would expect. 
Uh, let's say 21.5 billion insta per, per second. And then we'll look at... Uh, now we'll look at reads. Uh, mem read 8. And that doesn't... Um, and that shouldn't get optimized out. I don't remove loads because loads can fault. So we don't want to optimize those out. Reads will be... Let's see. Let's see if I'm right here. It does look like they will be faster than 64-bit memory writes, but just barely. They're almost comparable. Um, yeah, that I, that one's looking like a, a 21.5 as well. So, yeah, I'm going to hazard that's what that is as well. 21.5 billion instructions per second, and then 64-bit memory reads... And this will give us this. Uh, and then these are these are in the like 800 billion instant per second range. Like, all right. So I'm glad that my chart lined up with what I would expect. They're they're kind of in line, um, which is good to see. I like. I like when my estimates and what I think the performance properties are line up with actual results because that means that when I was developing this, I'm in the right mindset uh, to think about these things. Because if, if you don't know approximately what the costs of certain operations are, then, um, then it's kind of hard to develop. Like if you don't know the cost of things, it's hard to build primitives on top of those. I'm going to call this at 24 billion. Um, insert per second. So, basically, this means that um, if you have something that's just doing a hot loop of arithmetic, we're probably going to run in the 800 to 900 billion instruction per second mark. And that's exactly what we have in our uh, 6502 JIT when we're running 906 billion 6502 instructions per second in that hot loop. Then we have, if we're doing a bunch of conditional branches... That'll drop down to 120 billion. So if we're doing an add in a loop with a conditional branch, it'll probably max out at 120 billion instructions per second. For example, if we had a mem copy, or actually not a mem copy, if we had like, I don't know, something just summing something or like iterating through a loop, it would probably be in this 120 billion range. If we have a lot of indirect branches, which are rare, but like a lot of VF table use in like C++ and a lot of like returns, then we're probably in the 40 billion territory. And then for reads, let's just say like basically if you're doing any memory operations, you're at 20 billion. So that means if you do four, if you do five arithmetic operations for every memory operation, you'll be running in basically the 100 billion instruction per second range, which is kind of the target for a realistic target um, that I'm emulating. And that makes sense. If you're looking at 64-bit uh, assembly, so like if we just pop up IDA here and we'll just open up uh, literally anything on the system, um, we'll go to like C colon slash Windows system32 uh, calc.exe. Um, we'll just have to save that there. Okay. Uh, it's not 64-bit IDA. Uh, okay. This. Mm, yeah, yeah. Oh. Uh, calc.exe. Okay. This, this, this. Uh, yeah, we don't need a PDB. Don't really care. So if we take a look at, like, man, that, I feel like that really struggled. So when we're looking at like a 64-bit application, we're going to see like probably a lot of conditional branches, which will make us bottleneck potentially at the 120 billion. So that means like this cost, this is 120 billion, this one's free, and this is a memory access. So like this we could do 20 billion of, this we could do infinite of, and this we could do 120 billion of. So that means that this is going to bottleneck on this operation here, uh, which would mean that this block, like this whole function, for example, is probably going to run at like 20 billion instructions per second. 
because it's just it's just accessing so much memory. Like, quite frankly, this is what you get when you write C++ and, like, super high-level languages, is you just... They're using globals for everything. Like, what are you, what are you doing? Let me look at Notepad. Something written before 2010 when everything just used globals and memory accesses for everything. Notepad might do the same thing. Uh, we'll hop into... Now, keep in mind, those functions aren't where your bottlenecks are in an application. So... Your bottlenecks in an application are probably going to be like mem copies and allocations. Um, so like here's kind of a better example of a function. So like that's free, that's free, that's 20 billion a second, that's free, that's 20 billion a second, that's free. Uh, the branch, that's actually going to be a memory lookup. So like this here is probably going to run at like 25 billion instructions per second. Um, but obviously, if we had something that did a lot of math or something, that would probably go up to that, like, 900 billion range. There's just, we could, if we, even if we added a zero-cost TLB, the 20 billion would go to 80 billion, which would be amazing. So I'll look into that. I'll look into, like, trying to make these memory accesses quite a bit faster. Um, I would say the, the highest reasonable throughput that we're going to get is probably 50 billion a second on average for a, like worst case, um, ignoring the divergent cases because those start to get really expensive. So if I add a little bit of a TLB in here and I cache some memory accesses or some memory translations. Um, so actually in my IL, the reason I have a translate separate, separate from uh, memory read and write is the goal is that a translate will be a different instruction in my IL. And then that means that my... Um, that means that I will be able to um, use. I'll be able to like store the TLB in the graph, if that makes sense. So like, when when you write a lifter, you don't care about this. You'll just call like memread memwrite. But under the hood, a memread will turn into a translate. Like a memread eight would turn into like a a translate read eight that would output an IL register and then a access read eight that would then take that IL register from the translation. And that means that in the graph, we could optimize, um, we could basically stop accessing things multiple times every time we kind of go through this graph. It, I'm not explaining it too well, but, but basically the translation could be optimized to only be done once in the graph, and it causes the TLB to be stored in the graph, uh, which is a pretty big performance speed up. Um, so that means like any situation where you have a constant access inside of a loop um, that you're not paying the translation cost anymore. You're only paying the access cost, which means that you would pay the like eight cycles of overhead instead of 40 cycles in overhead. And that would basically give us a 4x speed up. So there's a chance that we could get this to 100 billion per second when I implement that architecture. So that's something I'm probably going to do in the upcoming week at some point. Because um, if I could get this to 100 billion a second... That's pretty phenomenal, um, but at twenty billion a second, I'm just I'm just not not super happy about it yet. So let's go back to our six five zero two application, and let's see what it looks like now that we've changed the um, page table size. So I don't know if we've run this since we did that, and. Yeah, it's, it's running in, like, the 15 billion mark. Um, and if we if we didn't have the the cost of logging the instruction instructions per second, we're probably actually in the 20 billion mark, which is basically the worst case for this tool, unless you have divergence, and in which case it can get much, much lower than that. Um, but divergence is not common, and if you get divergence, I don't really care about performance anymore because I, I learned something really interesting. So I don't really need to save that because I have that memorized. But yeah, that's where it's at. So we got a, we got about a 50% speed up on our JIT today, uh, which is pretty good. So I'm going to take a... Hmm, I should actually probably go make lunch. Um... What I want to do is I want to get a Commodore application loaded up here. So um, I'm going to write a... We're going to switch away from 
using the Atari, and we're going to switch to a Commodore 64. And the Commodore 64, this will now output a test.prg file. So if I build this, okay, and yep, that fills, of course. Uh, we'll grab the make file, and now this needs to remove, we'll say test.prg as well. Okay. So now we have our test PRG, and we'll do include bytes, K, okay. and this is now test.prg. And the way that test.prgs work, it's actually a really simple format. So um, we can take this, and I was playing around with like a JSON thing, seeing if I could get it to build. So the Commodore 64 has enough RAM that it'll allow us to... Uh, it'll allow us to... Um, we can load this meta PC, actually. Um, so the Commodore 64 has enough RAM that we can actually get a heap. So we'll be able to do mallocs and freeze. And when we can do mallocs and freeze, then we can kind of run almost any C code that we can compile. Uh, it'll be really slow, but we can run most C code probably in that environment. So the way the Commodore works here is the it just starts with a the load address, and then that's it. And then the remaining contents of the file are loaded at that load address. So um, so if we wanted to look at what this program actually looks like, it loads at 801 hex. So here we'll just say it's MIPS 65 or it's 6502. We're going to load at 801. The loading address is 801 and the file offset is 2 because we're going to skip those first two bytes, the, the load location. And then um, I don't think it starts executing right here. I think it executes A5 is the entry point here. Yeah. So, and I know that from uh, looking at kind of the assembly, the, the LDA1 is the first instruction that's supposed to run. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to load this to the correct location, and then I'm going to set up the... Um, then I'm going to uh, uh, just branch to this 80D. So we'll just do Atari... Uh, this will be C64 ROM is equal to include bytes this... Then we're going to do uh, assert uh, c65 rom dot dot 2 is equal to uh, 01x08. That's just so I can just hard code things. It makes it a little easier. 801, write force. We're going to write the c65 rom dot uh, 2 dot dot. And we're going to make sure that it's equal to the length of it. And then we're going to set PC. Uh, set execution to start at OX80E or 80D. Um, OX80D. Okay, so now we should be able to run that. Uh, we don't need to load. Uh, we don't need to add the memory for that. We will need to add memory here. So before we do our write, I'll need to yeah grab these two lines. Um, this we're gonna add memory at O. Oh, X801. We're going to write, uh, we'll say uh, C. Oh, I don't know why I'm doing C65 everywhere. C64, not that it matters. It's just a name. Uh, C64 ROM, include bytes. Then we're going to do C64 ROM len is equal to C64 ROM. Uh, actually, you know, I'll just slice it. Uh, this C64 ROM 2 dot dot. Okay. And then we'll do uh, this dot length. Set permissions at OX801. We're going to set this. Uh, we're going to set this to perm read and exec. Actually, uh, it will need to be readable. And then we'll do this dot len. Then here we'll write the C64 ROM. And here, we'll make sure that it's equal to the length of the C64 ROM. And set that PC. Okay, so uh, no comparison between those two. I think if I just put a ref there, I'm fine. Uh, oops, uh, put a ref here, I'm fine. Okay, so then we're just going to do this and see what happens. Okay, failed to read instruction at FFD2. Ooh. What is that? 
at uh, 429. I'm not actually quite sure what is happening here. So if we look at lifting instruction blah at that. So we're currently here and there's a JSR to FFD2. FFD2, I wonder what that is. That might be like a Commodore um, routine. Maybe that's like the Commodore BIOS or something. Let's see if we can find an explanation. Kernel functions. Yep. Yep. So this is the kernel, FFD2. Uh, writes a byte to the default output. If it's not on the screen, must open, uh, must call open and check out beforehand. Okay. So it's going to write a byte to the screen. Um, I think... For that, what I can do is that's going to do lifting instruction at FFD2. Okay. Um, I could just make that ret. I wonder how many other things this is going to execute. But we could actually start emulating some of these things. But let's just say... Um, if cur, hmm, lifting instruction there, read exec, read the opcode from memory. What is a ret? A ret is a, a like, um, RTS. Yeah. So I'm going to do just an, so that's doing a JSR. We're just going to do an RTS. So we're going to say, uh, if, so opcode if cur pc is equal to ox ff what was it ff uh ffd2 then we're going to do otherwise that in this case we're going to return the rts directly this is going to be uh ox60 this is a rts so basically, we'll do nothing in that case, and a semicolon here. So we're going to hijack that. Now we shouldn't have the, the read fault there, this avert adder. Oh, shit. OK. So JSR, and then we get FFD2. And let's see if this needs to do anything. Um, use registers that outputs nothing, takes an input. Okay. So that's just, if it's FFD2, we're just going to ret. Oh, is that derefing JSR? Are these pointers or is this the code or is this the code to actually execute? I guess I could get the kernel, um, I could load the C64 kernel. Uh, 39 functions for input and output and file management. So address. Um, how do I get a copy of this kernel? The kernel ROM is occupied in the last eight kilobytes of address space here. I might I might be able to just load this up potentially. I don't know. We could actually probably get pretty close to a Commodore 64 emulator pretty fast. Um so that's the last thing we get is that FFD2. Is that is that really it? This test program, we're not getting to main. Why are we not getting to main? If it's F52, we just emit an RTS. Um, I 
RTS, and that would return to this A75, wouldn't it? There, so JSR, and then we're not seeing it come back from there, which is weird. Uh, JSR. Yep, that's going to push 16. And then we're going to FFD2. We're going to get an RTS. I'm not sure. Why would that be failing? Let me take a look at um, uh, in our aisle session, VM exit. We'll print, uh, print exit code here. Exit code. Uh, MMU fault accessing A39. So that's going to run it. Oh, yeah, we don't have, like, anything mapped in. Um, C64 address space. We only map in, like, the zero page. Let's throw RAM. Um, so there's the kernel ROM. Here's some I.O., there's some RAM up here. I think we're just going to say here to here. We'll just map in up to uh, 8,000. Actually, maybe we can do less. I, I don't want to map in that much. I want to map in as little memory as I have to. Um, so A39. Uh, A39. Where am I going? At the end here. So we map in, we map in the zero page. That's good. Um, up to C64 ROM. A39. Oh, that's in our, that's in this range. Hopefully there's no self-modifying code. This might actually not allow it to run. Okay, branch, so you got a branch to A78, which is the return here, yep. And then that's lifting all this stuff, and then we're lifting at FFFF, ooh, at A31, really? Okay, are we disassembling incorrectly here? A55, LDY, Beck. Uh, we got an RTS here. We got an LDA, LDX, a jump, store, 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 DEY. How is that the end of this function? Uh-oh. DEY. DEY, isn't that just a decrement? Why would that be the end of this function? That that makes no sense to me. So let's look at the uh, let's look at the assembly. So we can see like some comments of what it's trying to do. I'm I'm not actually quite sure what that's doing there. Um, uh, GitHub C64 CRT0 uh, CC65. Okay. Wasn't I gonna get food? Ah, we'll we'll figure that out in a second. I want I want to see if this uh can get running fast here. We, we might end up, I mean, that function's easy. This function is easy. That one's easy. Like, where's main? I'm guessing, like, uh, RTS. This is probably main here. Maybe not. 
Yeah, this is main right here. So I, th I think we can get this. I think we can get this pretty easy. Uh, we just need to figure out what it is doing here. Um, okay, so we've got a... Failed to read instruction there. Okay. So what is this doing? So this is handwritten code. We want CC64, CRT0. So here's where we are. Load A, store, and F8, uh, or 6, TSX, store, A61. So we go into A61, which is sort save this. Uh, actually, this is a knit. Um, so a knit is going to do, I think it's using an undefined opcode. I think that's what's happening. I think it's using one of the, yeah. So, um, here we do the JSR BS out. Then we call the module constructors. Uh, we jump to init lib. So now we're in init lib. And that comes from who knows where? Maybe if I search for a colon, hopefully. We might have to clone this locally so we can do like actual searches. I don't I don't know why like literally no searches in any search engine ever correctly handles like separators or quotes. It's so annoying. Uh do we already have the code? No, that's the, like the built one. Come on. Tags are dots. Okay. And then we'll also do an rg init lib colon. Where would this be? init lib oh okay here we go so we can close this stuff now okay so this is doing a so exit so we've got a that ldy branch equal to exit otherwise Load A, load that, jump to Condes. Okay. Condes is. Oh, patched at runtime. Okay, so they do they do self-modifying code. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh. Come on. Generic call handler. Why do you why do you do this? Why do you do this? Like did you really need a runtime patch here? Is that really necessary? So this is fetch one. Yeah, so that's updating like right where it is. Oh man. Come on. Like that's just so they can save like two instructions. Load A, store A. So these are all patched at runtime. Uh. Mm. Is anything else self-modifying here? Yeah, this is also self-modifying. 
isn't it? No, those aren't. I'm trying to see if I can special case this one. I might be able to special case it by putting a branch indirect in there. Ah. Why can't it emulate self-modifying code? Because I have to lift the code, and I, I, it's a JIT, so self-modifying code and a JIT is extremely difficult because I would have to hook every write, and then I'd have to invalidate all of my lifted JITs, and I would have to like break out of the JIT, and the JIT could modify itself. It's really, 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 really hard. Um, it's like probably two days to implement that logic and to test it. Um, yeah, and that would add a lot of bloat in the MMU. So basically, if there's a right to code, if there's a right to data that's executable, I would have to have a database of all of the lifted code that contains those bytes so that I could invalidate them. And then if the code that's actually running is part of the code that needs to get invalidated, then I would need to return out from there early. So it's it's really a pain to do that. Um, how do I hack this? How do I hack this up? Generic table call handler. Goes into the data section for that, okay. Like, why don't they just do... Decrement Y, load, and then that gets patched. So it's like changing the address to fetch. Like, why? Like, you can do a jump indirect. Like, jump indirects are valid. So this, this would be fine. This one, you can do a load... And like, this is just unnecessary. They did this so they saved like four instructions. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's definitely not uncommon on the six five zero two. Um, that's really gross. Condes. And that's initializing like libc sort of stuff. Constructor table. So initialize library modules, clean up library modules. I'm guessing that's setting up. Hmm. For calling module constructors and destructors. I'm curious if I can, well, I could, I could probably modify this to like do the exact same effect. Um, but I'd have to like rebuild a compiler, but yeah, I don't know. Like adding, adding self-modifying code support is something I will eventually do, but it's not something I'm going to do in a, a one day stream. And it's not something I really want to do just so I can run some, some code here. So the question is, can I, can I patch this out? And it lib. Like, I'm curious how much that would affect if I ended up. Where's that defined? So there's another there's another mode here for C64, uh, for CC65. So CC65, uh, um, let's see if, where's the documentation at? Uh, let's see. There's like a CASM mode. Okay. So there's this configuration Just generate code that loads there. Like I can maybe let let's see if I can let's see if I can write my own loader instead of using their loader. So I'll switch to this. 
and we'll do this. So this should work. Oops, uh, where's my, here. Okay, so that built, and that is now based at that location, and it's not a PRG really anymore, but that's fine. The extension doesn't matter. So this, copy this, don't save here. 6502 here. And if we put this at, at C, this should be fine. This is the, uh, oops, what is that? Let me see what the specification is for that. Um, hmm. Oh, I, I screwed up the start address. Uh, I think that has to be a double dollar sign. There we go. So that, hopefully, is a runnable application. If I load it to that address... But this only allows assembly, so I'm going to have to implement my own uh, data sections and everything. So P, why is it putting a break out front? And then here's my assembly. No, is it? The assembly that I'm writing is this, LDY255. Is it? Oh, it puts the load address out front. Okay. Okay, okay. Undefine. Yep. Okay. So here's my code. So it puts the load address out front. So then technically this is this needs to be moved. Um, is there a way for it to not generate the start address? I think there is. Um, that's with the basic sysheader. Okay. So I think this is what we want to do. We want to just, we're probably just going to want to implement our own, uh, our own config. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to implement basically our own 6502 architecture that supports a lot of RAM and then doesn't have like initialization of like processor specific things. So to do that, we need to pass a config. And that isn't going to work because I won't find that file, I think. But we're going we're gonna to make our own... Um, okay, couldn't find that config file, and cool. Let's see. Let's see if this has the load address out front. I don't know if it will. Uh, we got to get that config file. So we're going to go into cc65 source um, c64 asm.config. So then we're going to grab this. We're going to whack this into our test app folder, and then this is going to be the uh, Falk 6502 system. So this is going to be our custom. This is going to be our custom 6502. And okay, code data, optional, define. So that's the... Uh, that's defining the zero page at two to FE, or for FE bytes. So that's up to two to a thousand hex. Then we have the load address, which I don't care about. Um, so we don't even need that. And then that file is not included. This is gonna write to the output file. It's gonna write at the starting address. And then we're gonna write the size, uh, that minus s so the size is is 4k so invalid memory area load adder get rid of it gone okay so now we have our test at prg this should be exactly uh, that minus s Start address. I don't know if I need that. I don't think I do. Okay. So we're defining the zero page. I don't think I, I need that. Like, is some, yeah. Okay. So in memory, we have main. That's going to output to the file. And the size is just going to be 
I guess that minus percent s, which is minus the start. I don't know how that's making a smaller thing. Percent s in this case should be c0. File, start, size, that, optional header. So I don't think we need that. Do we need the XE header? I don't think so. Okay. So let's see what happens if we bring in main with no headers. So test.c. Okay. So we've got main size and CRT zero. I don't want the C runtime. Maybe if I don't have a main. Okay, if I don't have a main, return zero. And then I should be able to in here. Um, here we're gonna implement like entry. This is the entry point. And then we're gonna do uh, like a JSR SDF. And then like loop, uh, uh, jump, loop. Okay, and this ASDF not defined, we'll do dot import ASDF. Uh, unresolved ASDF, I think. Maybe I say like extern. Oops. Import ASDF. ASDF is not found from here. Um, shouldn't that be visible since it's not static? Extern, that's for going the other way. Um, oh, it's that's going to be under ASDF. Yep. So there we go. So now we have an entry point. That's going to jump into that, and then it's going to infinitely loop. And in fact, this is just going to, like, fault. And we're going to do uh, store A into uh, uh, 1337. And how do you do the hex again? Let me find. I think it's just dollar sign. Okay. So now we have, and we're actually going to base this at zero just to make it easier to load into IDA while we're like testing it. So we'll take this program, boom, this, done, and then uh, set it to 6502. And now we can just do this. Yep. And here's our application. So we have this that jumps to sub six, which loads that. And then, uh, that jumps here, which returns out. So this is our main that jumps here. I don't know why they have a jump when it's a fall through. Um, and then that returns out, perfect. And if we look at sub zero, that's gonna JSR that, and then it's gonna store to that address. So now we have a valid application. So we're making our, we're making our own definition of a 6502 architecture. Okay, so, and let's see if I can do uh, data. Let's see if I can make a global. Int ASDF equals five, or like ASDF. So let's see if this has the data section supported. It does. So I should be able to return this. Okay, let's take a look at that. See if that looks valid. But yeah, we're gonna make our own 6502 implementation or hardware effectively okay that here's our sub six graph view that's going to load byte 10 which is in a data section looks looks beautiful to me so I'm, I'm happy with that um okay so let's see if i can do malloc and uh or like char foo equals malloc five Let's see if I can return uh, a char star from this. And, okay, undefined, yep. Uh, include uh, standard lib.h is where malloc comes from. Okay, so there's no stack size. Unresolved external used in stack size for heap. So let's take a look at how, so all those go into main. And we're just going to pull in the 
we're going to look at the other config file. Uh, dev cc65 source. We're going to look for cc65.cfg or uh, c64.cfg. And this should define a stack size. Okay, so we can we can basically say that this is where a software stack is. So while there's an implicit stack on the 6502 at uh, OX100 to OX1FF, this allows the C compiler to have like a custom stack. So now there's no memory assignment for zero page. So we'll just say, um, should be able to, we'll just steal theirs here. And that will just give a valid zero page thing. Or actually, it might be another thing. I need a zero page segment here. So we're going to say that the zero page exists here. And that's just due to the uh, malloc implementation using some of these segments. So we're going to say define yes. We're going to say it starts at zero. And it's size uh, 0100 which I think is correct. Yeah, that's the zero page. So we're going to say that is the zero page, and then we can link it up, and it's not actually part of our output file. Um, missing memory assignment for the once. Oh, this is probably going to set up the heap. So that, you probably need the condes, yeah, to set up the once. Okay, that's fine. So we get rid of this. We'll make our own malloc. We'll make our own damn malloc. No problem. So we should be able to return null from here. Uh, yep, and that's from standardlib.h. Uh, doesn't null come from there? But whatever. Okay, so we have store there. We have our architecture. We're going to put it at C. And that allows me to now change this to get the test program. And this is uh, fulcrum. Write the ROM into memory. This is going to be... In fact, what we want to do is... In this config, we have the RO data and data... So read-only data, uh, I think I want to have a header that says the size of code such that I can mark code as uh, read-only, read or execute-only. So let's see how they did that in the C64 config, which I keep closing. We'll look at this one. So to do that, they put the load adder here. And they did this. It was read only. Okay. And code, we're gonna do read only for code. Okay, so load adder. And then there. Segment load adder doesn't exist. But it but it but it does. Load adder there. Maybe it needs the symbol. Okay. So the load address is going to be. I guess we're going to use. Um, So that's going to say to load here. What's that going to complain with? Invalid memory area. OK, so that's the memory area. Then we have the segment. And then we define a symbol to write into there. And I think I want like data size or like code size. Let's see if I do this. Valid memory area here segment doesn't exist so I think these define the symbols that are defined here um, cc65 docs so 
CC sixty five. Uh, CFG. We'll look at CL65. Uh, maybe uh, the linker. Uh, CC65 config file. Where is the config file? Uh, there, there's something that like tells you how to write these config files, but basically I want the size of the code segment to be define yes, optional yes. Like that gets the load address. Um, Cause I think there's like, hmm. Start file there, starts there, size is equal to that, and the code size comes from the code size segment, which doesn't exist. Load adder, maybe that's like a special case. Oh, header last, okay. Stack size, features. Hmm. Header last. Ah, uh, C sixty five. Where is the documentation for this? Like what? C sixty five docs. Okay. Usage coding using make customizing. Oh, here we go. Uh, that and there. And our vector table. Startup code definition. Import ram start ram size, which are generated by the linker. But I think it automatically creates the labels for all of the things. So I'm, it might be... Uh, I see. So I could probably do... Like here I could do like... Dot segment code. Is it supposed to be in quotes? Yeah. That segment code, and let's see if this fails to build. Okay, perfect. Code, okay. And then I can do dot segment, okay, it makes sense. So code, so now I'm gonna say, uh, uh, yep, that's that config. Okay, I, I think I understand how these files work now. So load adder I don't need. So we're gonna say that at the start of memory, which will start at S minus two, we're gonna do size, and then we're gonna do code size here, which is in the code size segment. So here I'll make something called code size, and then this will have some bytes. I don't know how to define bytes. Uh, dot adder, adder, oh, one, uh, one, two, three, four. So that should put a one, two, three, four prefix at the start of our file. Uh, okay, dev soft serve 6502 test test app here. Oops, uh, let's take a look. Yep, so there's the 3, 4, and then there's a, a 1, 2 in front of it, which is an OD. So if I did like 4141, you'll see uh, now the program will start with two A's. Okay, so now we can make kind of a custom file format, and here we're going to do adder... Um, code size. Uh, so that's undefined. So I think it automatically creates some like segments. 
I thought it did. Like header last, last. Okay, maybe not there. Debugging, using make, internals, coding, intro. The linker. I'm just gonna search. Actually, I can maybe just grep and this will maybe show me where their docs are. Main last. I forget what last means. I think it's like the last used byte. Import main start main last, tape headers, okay. Does this not have the docs in here? No, it does. Last. LD65. Okay. Other memory attributes. This will define external symbols. This is what I was looking for. Uh, stack start, the size of the area, uh, not the same as start plus size. Instead, it's defined as the first address that is not used by data. If we don't define any segments for this area. Okay, so when I say code size of, let's say, 1,000, right? So I'm saying that there's uh, 1,000 bytes available for that. So I should have... So in here, if I do a dot import on this... I now should have access to that. Um, is that how you do it? Let's take a look at someone who uses it. Uh, the CFG files. How do you get that dot import under under main under last? Code size. I would kind of expect let's take a look so this is the XE header for the Apple 2 so that exports the XE header it imports file type and it imports main start and main last yeah so this is like creating this is doing effectively what we're doing is we're making like a header for this uh, custom architecture um, so I'll put these like Outside of the segment. So code size. Why don't I have access to that? So let's look at the uh, Apple II config file. Um, what was this? XE header? It'll just take a little bit of time to, to figure out how this works. Um, so this is the Apple II. Say this. Okay, how does this work? Symbols. Stack size. Size is equal to these. So how do I get access to the like code size? So that imports code size. So we know that the Lynx uses code size. Um, RO data size. So if we open the config for the Lynx, does this... Oh, define. Oh, that's probably what that is. Okay, okay. Okay, so we'll say like define equals yes. I think that's what we need to do. Yeah. Okay, so when we make memory, we just need to do define equals uh, yes, I think. And what about these? Oh, define equals yes on segments. So we'll do define equals yes. 
and then optional. Okay. There we go. So now we have the size of main. Now I think that's always going to be a thousand hex. Um, yep. So now we have like, this is always the same size. Uh, so that's main. And now that will output. So code size. That should be correct, I think. So let's see if we whack this into Ida. It'll be basically the size of the code segment. So we're going to load at C00 minus 2. And this will allow us to make like a header. So we'll be able to say kind of, uh, we'll be able to make a header of all of the segments. And then we'll be able to set the permissions on everything manually, which will be nice. So we'll do this. Um, define yes. Uh, code size. So this is the code size. This is going to be the exe header. We'll call this the folk header. This is going to be the folk header format. And then this will subtract uh, one, two, three, four. Uh, so this will subtract two times four, which is eight. So we're going to have our header at the start of the file. That's going to be exactly eight bytes followed by a page. And we're going to define our header here. I'm just going to clean this up so alignment looks better. Okay, looks good. And then we're going to put define here. Put some commas. Okay, and then we'll put some spaces. So now we're saying that the folk header is here, it's read only, it's an eight byte thing that goes before the start address. Then we're gonna have to the output file, then we're gonna have a one page or a 4K that goes at the start address, that's main. And main will have code followed by RO data, followed by data, followed by BSS. And that's read only, that's read only, data's read write. Okay, so then, uh, and then all of those are optional. Can I make code optional, is that? that complain? Okay, that does complain. Actually, I think if I make these optional, I think it might not be able to define those. So maybe this works. Okay, folk header doesn't exist. Perfect. So now we'll go into the folk header here. We're going to import code size, RO data size, data size, and uh, BSS size. And then down here, we'll just do them in order. And then this will tell us basically our permissions of everything. Perfect. So now we've generated a header. So if we look at the size of this file, it should be um, 22 bytes. Uh, define yes. That might only be using what it needs to which is fine if that's the case. So define yes, 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 yes. And then we just export code, RO data, data, BSS, and that's how they are ordered in memory into this location. So now we can take our test program here. We're gonna load this at 6502. We're gonna load this at C00 minus eight. And then the first few bytes, we're going to have the size, that's the, the code size, the size of data, the size of uh, our RO data, data, and BSS. And then we should have our application immediately executable here in our entry point. Awesome. So now we have defined that, and we can set the permissions strictly to exactly the size of these regions. Uh, so now we're going to write a little loader for this quote unquote architecture. So let's make sure like a string works. Let's see if I can return, uh, ASDF. So this will be a little bit more complex example. Complex, not actually complex. So 6502. Yep. Load to here, load to here. Good. Okay. DD, DD, so there's ASDF with an alterminator and RO data, which is exactly what I wanted. 
And then we have this. We have jump, return. Okay, looks good. Um, that's going to call our main routine, and then that's going to deref. Uh, it's going to write delete, causing a fault. So here we have load uh, A E. Ooh. That is incorrect. Um, so it's returning E. So at C O O E, that's going to be the string. For some reason, the C000 is not being added. Percent S, that's the start adder. I'm just going to hard code this. I will just say the that header's at zero. It do, it doesn't matter. Size is eight. Okay. So now we have our application, and now it's probably ignoring that start adder, which is fine. And I don't know if this fixes it. I probably have to add this. Like, I have to tell something about that offset. I think. Yeah, that's loading. Uh, loading e there so okay somehow i have to tell it where these are based at let's take a look at links and hopefully there's a so start optional define huh stack size start of directory i don't know why we're outputting to the output file. Why would that happen? Why would they not know where they are based at? Jump there. That's a relative jump. But then that's loading E, which is just not... Does this assume that I like copy that to the zero page? So that's constant E, load it into A, return out. Let's see what happens if I were to like have someone use that pointer. Let's see if I can like deref that, we'll, like return that. I wanna see if that deref's the right thing. It sh well that, that one should. I don't. I need to make sure that returning pointers is is correct, because otherwise that's gonna get us in a in a weird situation there. Um. Okay. So if we build that, yeah, that's weird. Because I think this one's correct. It seems like they know how to access data correctly but maybe they don't know how to return pointers, which would be a big issue. Um, code starts at C. Here's our program. That's loading this. So it's loading the right byte there, and then it returns that out. I don't know why it has that jump. So we're gonna have this function is gonna return this. Um, get string, we'll just call that get string, and then we'll do uh, get byte, or we'll call this ASDF again, void, and this will take the character, and then we'll do um, return times get string. Uh, missing memory area for zero page. Okay, that's good. That means it's now using the zero page, so we just need to copy like a good implementation of the zero page here. So we're gonna define the zero page at that. We're gonna move the define to the end. We're just gonna make sure that it's known where the zero page is, and then we'll say the zero page is loaded there, and it's a type ZP. So I think this is gonna work now. Yeah, 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 yeah. So now we give it the zero page, we define that. If we don't define it, I'm guessing this will fail because it doesn't have a symbol. No, well, we'll leave the define there. Eh, we'll, f we'll fail. We'll, we'll see if it ever fails. 
So now... Yeah, when it was returning that to assembly, it was wrong, which is kind of weird, but let's see what this does. So now we have our application. We branch to main. Um, and I'm going to make this analysis easier on Ida by adding an infinite loop. So we're going to do uh, at the end of this, we'll do loop, jump loop. So that will make that cleaner, make the analysis better in Ida. Oops, 6502, load to this. Okay, P. And so here is, yep, here's the, like, the entry point. This will jump into main. That's gonna call this function to get the address. And it's going to load a and then C0. Oh, maybe the other one was fine if it was returning C0 as the top byte. I think it was fine. And then that's RTS. And then down here, we're going to load Y0. Then we're going to jump here. This is going to store A and X to 8 and 9 in the 0 page. And then we're going to load X. Uh, we're going to load from the 0 page 0, which is going to perform the DRF to get the... Uh, yeah. And then we're going to load Y. Perfect. So that's that works. OK, so everything everything should work. We now, we now should be able to write relatively complex uh, C applications in our own confined application. Um, and permissions are going to be very strict. So zero page, there's going to be no self-modifying code. Uh, read only for these segments, read write for this. BSS will be read write. Um, we're going to have to probably zero out that BSS. Actually, memory is zeroed when we allocate it, so that's fine. So we're going to load uh, uh, read the fulcrum. Fulcrum. And then we're going to get the Oh, yeah, I did disassembly. Man, it's it's so much better than using like obstump or something. It's the life. Yeah, I use Ida all the time to like verify uh, that my code's correct and everything. Start, I guess here we can use the, what was it, percent %s, I think, percent cap %s. So we'll put this at that, minus 8. We'll put this at cap %s. That way it doesn't conflict with the zero page, just in case that matters. And now we can actually relocate our entire thing by, by moving it. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, so we'll actually want to grab, we'll put an A there, and this will be A bytes now. And then we're going to change our header one last time uh, here. And we're going to say this is also going to have the like load address. What was it? Um, let's see if we can find something like this XE header. This one might, like, hopefully tell us where main start. Yeah, main start. That's good enough. So now, now we have a file format that tells us where the start of things are. Uh, main start, yeah, we don't have. Um, honestly, we can go to our config. And we know that this is just uh, code start. Well, we'll do main start. Because that's the f actual contents. Uh, so we'll do define equals yes on this. Oop. And this needs to be pulled in. So that's like our main section. We'll format this a little bit better here. We'll just do this. Import ASDF. Uh, we'll call this main or like uh, uh, kernel entry. We're going to call it a kernel. So that's going to call kernel entry, and this is kernel entry, and it's a void. OK. So now we have our kernel. Sweet. And then we should be able to just change the starting address based on changing that field, and everything else will just magically work. 
Sweet. So now we're going to parse out this header. So um, we'll get the load base is going to be equal to uh, folk rom. If only the license wasn't expensive. Yeah, sadly, it's it ain't cheap. Uh, so we're going to do this. And we'll do u16 from le bytes. Um, dot try into dot unwrap. And we might not have try into. Yep, so this is in uh, use standard convert try into, I think. Um, so that built that. Then we're going to have our uh, this. Okay, nice. So that's going to get the load base. Then we're going to get the, um, we'll get the code size, RO data size, data size, and the BSS size. Okay, and then we'll do two, four, eight, uh, two, four, six, eight, and this will be two, four, six, eight, A. Um, okay. So I'll just do, I'll count this out temporarily, and we'll just do like a panic here. Uh, panic X. And we'll just print all these things out, just so we have like a good idea of what it looks like. And we should have load base, code size, RO data size, data size, BSS size. And now we're going to have like a nice file format. Nice. We're based there. That's the size of the text section or the code section. That's the data section. Perfect. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Okay. So now if I change this to a B. That will probably just change where it's based at, and then that will update everything. So we can now just kind of move around. Arbit yeah, perfect. How cool is that? So now we have our own 6502 implementation that will byte level trim down every single region. So then we're going to do let payload is equal to include. Uh, payload is going to be equal to falk rom oxa. Um, and you know what? I don't need the, uh, whoops. So these don't actually need to be two bytes. Um, okay. So get the contents that needs to be loaded at load base. Perfect. So we're going to do, we're going to add memory. We're going to add memory at load base as u size. And then we're going to get the uh, payload.len. So this will be create memory for the entire image. Perfect. That should work. Looks good. Then I want to create the mapping. So we added all of that memory. And then we'll do four. Um, or actually, we'll do uh, set permissions. And then this will be at, maybe I just grab the basis for all the sections just to make it easier. And then I could potentially split up the sections, um, which would be really interesting. But if we split up the sections, then we could like really make memory sparse and do some kind of cool things there. So, eh, eh, eh. Okay. We're going to add memory, payload line. Set permissions uh, at the load base for code size. It's going to be execute only. And that's going to be equal to code size. OK, so and we're going to need to accumulate that mute uh, adder is equal to load base as use size. We'll just do this. OK, and then. These we're all gonna want. We're gonna want to convert all of these to a, a a u size here. 
Okay. So then, after this, we'll do adder plus equals code size. So this will be uh, get a pointer to uh, the load base, set permissions for the code section, and then we'll do set permissions for the RO data, uh, RO data size, this, 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 and this will be perm read, so read only. And then we'll do for the data section, data size, this, this, this will be read and write. And finally, for the BSS, BSS section, we're gonna call this, uh, we're gonna put it read only with the raw bit. So it can be, uh, actually, it's gonna be perm write. So it's writable memory, but it's only readable after it's been written to at least once. So data size, and then this is BSS size. Okay. So now we've mapped everything in, and we just need to write everything. So then uh, write everything in. So we'll do uh, assert vm.mmu.writeForce online vert adder load base payload is equal to payload.len failed to write in ROM or image. So now we have a loader. Uh, perm raw, we, yeah, we just didn't bring it in. Roop. Okay, and the last one's not used. That's fine. I'll just comment it out. Okay, so we add memory at the load base for the size of the payload. We get a pointer to the load base. We then set executable for the code. We set readable for the RO data. We set uh, read write for or for the RO data. We set read write for the data. We set write and then read after write for BSS. So if it's not written to, if it's not initialized, then it will fail. Now it probably expects that we build that. Uh, or it probably is expecting that we initialize the BSS in our in our loader, but it's not a big deal. And then finally, set PC to start at load base. There we go. VM dot uh, VM dot MMU or VM dot set regs register PC or actually set reg online PC OX uh, load base. Boom. So now we can dynamically move that around. Yeah. And they're faulting because they're hitting the uh, end condition. Um, okay. All right. Sweet. Yeah, lifted. Got that RTS. Everything looks good. Um, it's really slow because it's resetting so much, right? Because we're doing like, we're just constantly resetting. It's not actually really running anything. So if we change our code now in here, kernel entry, if we just did like int ii for ii is equal to zero, or we'll do ii is equal to... Um, 30, uh, yeah, 30,000 should fit while ii minus minus this built ship it. Okay. Are we, oh, we're running a, we're running a single thread. It's like, man, why is that so slow? This should be better. Okay, now we're at that like 15 billion instructions per second that, that we expect to have. Perfect. So I'm going to take one quick break. Uh, let me read chat. Um, uh, I've been interested in low-level hacking and exploitation for a while now. Do you have any advice on to where to start? Uh, blogs to follow, projects to try out, stuff to read, and tech to look at. I would recommend just kind of hopping directly into some like some of the CTFs that are aimed at learning. I would look at learning um, like... Uh, some 32-bit assembly, like getting comfortable with that. So 
there's probably some good tutorials. There's like one university that apparently puts out like a tutorial on these things that works pretty well. Uh, yeah, I, uh, wow. Okay. Huh. Um, yeah, this site must have just gotten flagged kind of unluckily. So let's find just a mirror of that. Here we go. Oh, this is, is this the same one? But there, there are a bunch of things like this. Uh, this does look like that is that course. So there's like a bunch of different references you can get. Um, so I would learn like 32-bit or 64-bit assembly, kind of get comfortable with those things. Uh, then I would get comfortable with some CTF challenges. Um, and then from there, hopefully you would have like a, a good idea of kind of where to go next. So I'm going to take a, a quick break to heat up some food. I'll be right back.
All right. What is up? I'm back. Let's see. Where do we leave off? We left off with... We need to move the 6502 um, lifter into a different module. And we're going to start kind of cleaning this up, so... Okay, so what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to move the 6502 um, uh, lifter into a library because it now, it, since it's complete and we're no longer just playing around with it, I think it's time to move it into an actual uh, library. So we'll go into soft serve and we'll make something called bulk IL 6502 and... Uh, we'll just do cargo init lib. Okay. I hate how it doesn't make a git ignore for those, uh, for libraries. It does for like uh, mains, but it doesn't for libraries, which means if you test it, you end up with kind of a lot of pollution. But whatever. We're going to copy this whole thing into here. Done. And... Then we're just going to get rid of all of this. Okay. Yep, sorry, intermission. Yeah, I need to get better at that. I need to get a stream deck, what I really should do. So this is, we called this test VM. And we're, we're going to call this uh, target 6502. So structure for 6502 lifting. And then the track I count. We could maybe have that as a flag when we create the target. Um, okay, we have all of our registers, all of that stuff. I think that should just be fine as is. And then that means we should be able to delete everything in here except for context. Okay. And we'll be able to delete a lot of this stuff pretty quick here, too. So we're going to do, uh, we don't need pub extern create anymore. Okay. So then we're going to make our 6502 test. This is going to then depend on that. So this will depend on bulk IL 6502, which can be found here. And then we'll pull in use... Bulk L 6502, target 6502, and then that, that, uh, can't find Folk IL. Where, oh, yeah, yeah, and that, um, yeah. So we'll edit this. We'll basically need these. I don't need L float in here either. Okay. I don't think I need M. Oh, I do for the, okay, for those flags. I should just have that ex exported from uh, Falk IL. Okay, so this, just this, dependencies, boom. Okay, test VM, yep. We're just gonna have to change a couple things there. Uh, target 6502. Okay, and then this isn't using try into. It's not using rewrite exec. Oh, it is using exec, but it's not using raw. Um, not using those. Okay, clean. So that's now in a library. And now I can pull in register from here. So I'll do pull in register. Uh, I'm, that might not be public. Yup, private, private. Okay. Gotta just make this public. And I'll make this public as well. And then this we'll do, we'll put a field on here called track I count. It's a bool. Uh, if set to true instruction counts will be added to the i count register if self dot 
track I count. Uh, 15, no semicolon, it's not C. And then 379, we just need to say uh, track I count will the, uh, oops. We'll set that to track I count, we'll set it to true by default. Okay, so that's done. And VecDQ, we're not using soft MMU, we don't need. Um, none of the folk IL, those internals, don't need mask, target VM we don't need. All right, so now we have a much smaller application here that's kind of just targeted specifically at fuzzing, uh, or it's targeted specifically, so like this is, this is kind of what I intend for like a user of this tool to write. So now we have a 70 line of code thing. I create an IL session. I say that it, I want to target 6502. I say call this function. This will be responsible for making them like master VM. Then at the master VM, I'm just going to set this up. So I'm going to add the zero page. I'm going to add, um, actually this I'm also going to make uh, write only and then perm raw. So uh, so perm read. So nothing should be readable except for RO data and the data section. Everything else needs to be written to first before it can be read. Okay. So now this is kind of like what you write for an application. I just need to add a hook for this now. So I'm going to add a, um, I'm going to add like a fault handler. Uh, off topic, what are you using for streaming? I'm using uh, Streamlabs OBS. Um, it's basically OBS, but it's just got a, a couple more nice features here and there. So it, it allows like the pop-ups when like people have followed and it has, it, you can like buy themes and stuff. So you can like theme all like those transitions I had. I just like bought those themes. Um, eventually I'll want to like pay someone to make themes specifically for me. Um, But, uh, okay. One second here. Okay. So, we don't need the MMU open anymore. And we're just creating everything here. Target registers. Looks good. Um, so, what I want to do is I want to add a callback. And I want to call it, let's call it crash callback. Now, let's take a T and a Y. Function mute ILVM T, take a Y, and then it's going to also take a, um, what do I want to pass this? I want to pass this like a, um, actually this, instead of, this can just be like VM exit callback, and we can call this, uh, what did I call it? Folk IL, IL result. So we'll call this, uh, yeah, VM exit callback. And that will take a reference to an IL result. That looks good. Okay, that's not used anywhere. So coverage callback. So we're going to have a box to a TY. This is going to be a uh, um, VM exit callback. And VM exit callback. And then add a VM exit function callback every time a VM exit occurs. Okay, VM exit callback there. Perfect. So now I should be able to make something with that same shape. We're just going to go and find VM exit callback here. Uh, cause VM exit. Here we'll do a at the very end. So that we'll we'll have to find a better hook spot there. So we're gonna we're gonna implement the function first over here. VM exit callback. This will take a mute ILVM target 
6502. It'll take a context. So VM, a context, which is not used. Then we're going to have a caused VM exit, which is going to be a mask. Then we're going to have a uh, IL results. We'll just call it results. Here, print got a VM exit on X due to this caused VM exit dot zero results. And then here we'll do a uh, setup uh, VM exit callback is going to be equal to VM exit. Hey. So that's not going to get called yet because we haven't actually invoked that callback. So we just got to put that in there. Um, I'll result. Okay, we just need to pull that in. Um, that actually comes from I'll graph. So I'll grab that. And then mask. We'll get that from uh, use vectorized mask uh, MMU. I guess I can get it from there. MMU vectorize. Uh, Falk IL vectorized mask. Okay. So we pull in the mask, and then here we also want to have this take a mask. Okay, so now we just want to perform the callback. So down here, oh, that's the JIT stuff. And then where have we ever match? So here we have the resulting online. We have the exit code. And remove that. Access fault, update the cause VM exit here. Uh, disable those things. Everything uses that. We can get rid of this print. And then at the end, here, I can say if let sum VM exit callback is equal to self dot VM exit callback, VM exit, uh, VM exit callback, um, self. And what else? We have this self, and then how do we do callback somewhere else? I just want an example of another callback. Setup callback. Uh, coverage uh, coverage callback would be a good one. Oh, am I not using that right now? Ah, am I not using this either? No, I am. Okay, mute VM, and then we call run. Uh oh, so we're gonna write something basically like this: call the VM exit callback, call the VM exit callback. This, this, I think this is self. And then we have the context, and then we also pass in the uh, caused VM exit as well as the uh, exit code and a reference to that one. Whoa. 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 What? Did I break? What did I break? Neocortex, thanks for following. Does this build? Yeah, okay. Okay, so now we should get VM exit callbacks. We're gonna see some with a zero mask, so I'm gonna make a special case for that. Uh, down here, we'll do a 
ooh, dot zero is private, so we'll just do uh, x. Okay, so we should see some faults. Let's see. Yeah, I got a VM exit due to a zero. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say if not caused VM exit dot all disabled, if they're not all disabled, so it's possible that we like handled the VM exit above. So we only want to actually dispatch those when a fault occurs. Nice. Okay, so this is faulting there. And I need to, I actually need a way of getting PC up at some point. That's like, I could maybe look backwards through the JIT table potentially. Um, Cause I, I need to get the address of what caused the VMix or the fault. Let's see. So this is faulting because it's trying to read from one. I actually want to look at that. Um, so this apparently load A, load X. Okay, those are fine. Then this store A, store X, load X zero, load A that. Why is it? Why is it reading from? What did we implement? Did we change our code at all? I don't think so. Yeah, let's take a look at what this generates. So we've got our C program here. We're gonna grab the program. Where is it? Here it is. And for some reason, this is derefing the null page before it ever initializes it. So I'm, I'm curious what it's actually doing here. Um, because I have that zero page as read after write, so it will fault unless Burke. Why is that just why is that just breaking? Um, test main. Oh, JSR kernel entry. What's going on there? Oh, I, I got to load at uh, minus 10. But that's sh that should be fine in, in my stuff. So it, that was just a IDA visualization issue. Um, so now we do this set. OK, and then instead, this is now subtracting A. And then at C, this is the start. There's our JSR. So load, load, JSR push SBC to transfer X to A. So that's going to write to Y. Do we not set the raw? Oh, we don't set the, oh, we do set the raw bit there. Hmm. Perm right, perm raw. This is gonna store to uh, transfer X to A. So this should store. I feel like this should correctly be writing to it. Does it load from it first? Oh, LDA zero. Why is it doing that? Like that LDA is, that's, what? Access fault there. Oh, is it due to our uh, PHA? It's our, it's our, uh, it's probably due to our stack. Let's set up a stack. Uh, set up the stack. We're gonna set uh, SP is gonna be equal to OXFF.
Okay, now we're uh, reading zero, which is this. So this is, this is really interesting here that it's doing a load A of zero because cause that, it doesn't know what's at zero. Like it's, a, it's just derefing zero even though, I guess is the zero page always zero at the start? But why, why would you ever want to load memory that you've never written to yet? PHA, that pushes A, load A, LDA. Actually, we should, uh, we should now fix our, um, our push and pop macros in uh, SP full KL 6502 source. We're gonna we're gonna try and make this a little bit more accurate. Uh, push eight. So we want to add the base to it unconditionally. Um, reg read SP. That's always an eight bit thing, so that's fine. We'll get uh, offset is equal to graph dot m aisle word ox one hundred. This will add the hundred base. Let sp is equal to graph dot add sp offset. That's now a sixteen bit value. Okay, so that's done. I'm just trying to make it even more correct by reading that stack. Okay, add that. Memorate sixteen. Reg read sp. Get sp, add 100 to it. And sp, that will never overflow. We don't have to worry about that. Then here, it's a 16-bit pointer. Ooh, that add could... That one could overflow it. Okay, so this one, we're going to take sp, which is 0 to ff, add 100. We don't have to worry about that going out of bounds. That's fine. We don't have to worry about that going out of bounds. Every time we do a reg write, every time we do a reg write to SP, we will zero extend it. So anytime we read from SP, um, it's also going to be zero extended because there's no way to write it first. So uh, pull 16. Oops. So when we push, we get SP, we add. 100 hex to it, we write that, okay. Then in this case, we get SP, we add 100 hex to it. So this one's fine. This one, that one's fine because it's writing to SP. This one, since I subtract from it, I need to actually um, zero extend SP. Um, I guess this is a nine bit number. We zero, we subtract. So if SP is zero, then SP at this point would be a hundred hex. Then this would perform a sub. And then we lost the hundred here. Okay, we, yeah, we need to fix that. So in this case, SP, add 100. So it's 100 to 1FF, that's fine. Then here, we write the value using SP as a 16-bit pointer. That's fine, because it's always correct. We then take one, we subtract it from SP, and then we zero extend it when we write it. So push eight is correct. This one, I think what I need to do is here we'll get SP. We'll subtract one to get the location of the 16-bit value to write. So sub SP1. Then I will zero extend SP, the new SP. So I will then zero extend the new SP and add OX100 to it. So SP. That, subtract one, zero extend it, uh, add our 100x to it, and that's our new SP, and then we write to that location as a 16-bit value, we subtract one more 
and then we zero extend it when we write it. So that one's correct. Pull eight, get SP, get the immediate, add that. And then we update it by adding to it. So what we actually need to do here, it's kind of the same as above. Uh, we need to do this after the fact. Let SP is equal to graph dot zero extend SP uh, aisle word eight. So we add our one to the stack pointer. We zero extend it, then we add our 100 to it. OK. And we draw our memory from that location, and we also store that. Ooh, we don't want to store that as the SP. We want to store that as the SP, then zero extend and add base. Zero extend SP, get 100 hex base, add that base to SP, and then we read from that as a 16-bit value. That's always correct. Then in this case, get SP, make it point to the 16-bit value. We want to zero extend it here. Oh, we got to fix the other one too, I think. Um, we're going to call this SPZX, and we're going to do this. So SPZX is equal to SP point to a 16 bit, bit value. Yep, we add one, we zero extend that, we then get the immediate, we add 100 to it, we then read from that location, but we use, then we update the SP, the original SP without the 100 bit base added to it, and then write that out. So then this one, uh, immediate, get, uh, add one, write it out. Then we zero extend that, that one's fine. This one, we read immediate, sub zero extend uh, this reg write is going to be incorrect because it has the base added so we're just going to do the same thing as before uh, we're going to get the we're going to zero extend the sp get the immediate add that to it and then we're going to read from spzx and then sp is what we use here and then this one was fine from the start we're just adding oh actually this one's not correct either Uh, SPZX, this, which is, that one is just SP plus the offset, and then you read from that. This one, we do a separate one for that, but we maintain the old SP, and then this one, we actually reg write it before we update it, and then this one, we, immediate one, zero extend, add the immediate SPZX, then we update it. Okay, so this should now be correct. Oof. Oof. Okay, so it's it's faulting due to a 1FE access. That's fine. Um, and that's the JSR, the first JSR routine. So we just need to add... We need to add a... Uh, 6502 stack. So I'll add a stack as well, which will be at... OX100 for OX100, and that's writable raw. Okay, so now we're faulting on a DRF of zero, and that's happening due to this load A0, and I, I don't I don't know why this is DREFing zero, and then store, it's like subtracting from the zero location. Is there a special value there? Um, like, maybe there's a special value in, in the zero page. Um, like a jump table. Because I don't, I don't know why it would be writing... I don't know why it would load, push A, load A from zero. But it's it's just derefing zero before anything would initialize. Maybe, it's, 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 maybe it expects that the zero page is zeroed. So let's just say that you can read it. Well, that's going to fault. What? What is this doing? JSR here. 
We load A and X there. We push A. Is this a compiler bug? Like what? Why would it? Here's loading that. Set carry, subtract with borrow to. So it's subtracting to STA. Is that supposed to be the soft stack address? Maybe it puts the soft stack address at zero, the software like stack implementation. Cause like it's subtracting two and then, cause that's gonna go out of load A, load Y, and then we're gonna store A based on, oh. Yeah, and then we're accessing due to write to this, which is gonna be this store, I think. Yeah, writing to the address pointed to by that. I think. I think that's the soft stack. Let me see. Let's take a look at the uh, 6502 code or the compiler code. So, for some reason. Stack, start at the top of stack. So that's loading that. Main stack size, stir stack, int stack. It looks like that definitely is supposed to be a stack. Expert. But I just want to confirm that. I also don't know if it's like pre-indexed or post-indexed. SP save. Reg swap, push. Set up the C stack. Let's check this out. Startup, SP save. Res one. So does that start out at, at one? Save the system stack pointer. Using all of these, res one, load A. Yeah, I think there's a stack pointer there, but I, I, I don't know if it's supposed to be uh, pre indexed or post indexed. Um, 6502 system stack. Let's see. Virtual stacks. Resides in page one. Yep. I need specifically for this C one. So TSX, transfer S to X, and then it's going to store X. So it's gonna store FF to there. In this case, loading A, subtracting two from that, storing that back out, or it's subtracting one from it, I think in this case, SEC. Store A, okay, so let's see, let's, I can, I we'll put a software stack in there, so let's do a, um, create, a software stack add some memory we'll just add we'll make like a 256 byte stack that's probably fine right um we'll put it at 4000 
and then we'll do vm.mmu set permissions and then this stack will be uninitialized by default and then that means that we can set this to uh, permraw again okay so we've got 4256 we're then going to at that location for 256 256 we've created a software stack and then we'll do vm.mmu dot write force online vert adder zero um right here we'll do a write we don't want to write force in this in this case and then we'll write uh ox4000 u16 equals two assert i think i need to like uh convert those to bytes somehow uh got some parens going on here assert that borrow that so that should write in the stack okay access fault due to 3ff uh a write to 3ff yep that's because we want to add uh what we want to write is actually the end so we'll do const stack base u16 x ox 4000 as a u size and then we'll do const stack size u16 equals uh, 256. Stack size. And then this will be stack base plus stack size. We're going to see if this works. This might fault. If it does, then we need to make it uh, like post indexed. Um, yep as you size as you size hey there's our lead okay sweet we did it okay so and then i want to see what we get for uh initial vm exits i'm just trying to control c it early there we go Okay, VM exits due to branches. Those are fine. Then we get our first fault, and it's at leap. Perfect. It hid all of the internal page and in faults. Okay. Uh, print. Okay, so now we can say match. Match. Results. And then we'll say IL results. Uh, MMU fault. So let's say an MMU fault here. And then that has the vector. So MMU fault uh, type. Type. Is right. So the type is right. And uh, size. And then adders. So then I'll do let. Adder is equal to uh, adders dot extract zero. Assert or if adder is not equal to us one delete, then we'll say print this result. So if the address is not equal to delete, then we'll do that. So we'll filter out leets for our prints. And cause beam exit, we're not using. Everything else, just ignore. Okay, so we have no faults, no surprise. Everything look, looks fantastic. Okay. Um. All right, so now, now we should be able to write basically any C in our application. So, and perf looks fine here. It's not great. I mean, this compiler just has terrible code gen. Um, but it works for 6502, so that's impressive. I'm not ripping on the compiler. I, I wouldn't expect it to have good code gen. Okay, so now I want to implement a uh, a malloc, I think. So we're going to do uh, 
char times buff equals malik 32. Is that? Oh, we didn't oh, we didn't build it. It's like okay, yeah. Undefined reference to that. Um, and I'm probably gonna need to call it something else. So if I did include standard lib, it'll try to use the existing one. Stack size on reference. So what if I did a uh, size uh, size? What if I did this? Nice. And null should be in... Shouldn't null be in standard lib? I thought it was standard lib. Standard def? Hey, there we go. Okay. So this should call our, our custom malloc uh, parameter size never used. Okay. So then here I'm gonna do a int uh, volatile int ox ffe is equal to zero. Okay, so we should see faults now at ffe. Perfect. Um, and then that's going to give us a hooking point. So we can actually implement alloc at the, um, we can implement malloc in our uh, plugin here, which will allow us to make it a bite size allocation and provide like ASLR. So we'll have like ASLR on all these regions, which is going to be really interesting. So we'll have context. And in context, we're going to put in a struct. We're going to put in like elk base is equal to u size, uh, current pointer to return for allocations. Current pointer to return for allocations. Okay. So then, uh, 83. So then we'll say elk base, oops. Elk base is, and that is, what is this? This is the create master VM. So here we're going to just say, uh, we'll just say none. We'll make this an option. And then we'll fill it in when we start a VM. So we'll get a fuzz callback here. Fuzz VM. And what did that look like? Okay, simple. So then we'll make a fuzz callback here. That will take that will get access to our context. We're also gonna have to put that in a cell. Because we need interior mutability, because context we only get access to as a uh, reference. Oh, is context used between all workers? I can't remember if context is used between all workers or not. So let's look at context. I think I create a context for every, no. No, so context is, yeah. So that's passed to all the threads. So that actually will fail to build, I guess. Um, Cause context is in here and it needs to be send in sync. Y needs to be send in sync, and cell is not send or sync. Okay. Uh, I want, like, a context per fuzzer, actually. Hmm. How do I want to plumb that through? I guess I have the VM. I could, I could have VM. I could store something on VM. Um... Self context set up callback. Yep. So you have that context and aisle VM. So VM, of course, is per thread. And I just I need to add 
Maybe I make this take another type. Can I make ILVM take a type? Um, call it C. Okay. All of those, we just need two type arguments on those, but I think this shouldn't be too bad. This will take a C as well. Doop, doop, doop. And then we're going to give a mutable access to a context structure here. So, oops. So these also TY, these are TYCs. Doop, doop, doop. Coverage callback, uh, 480. That's an aisle session. I guess. Um, oh, that's kind of weird. How do I do that? I'll VM this. So if I do setup callback, that also takes a C that's unconstrained. Okay. So then I need a C down here. 105, this takes a C. And a C here. And 713. Twenty-three. TYC. Okay, 565. All these just need a C field. Unused parameter on 68. Perfect. So then this will have um this will have like the um fuzzer state C. Uh, fuzzer state structure per VM. Okay. And I, I might need to add a default constraint on there. I can do option. 111. Uh, fuzzer state none. 610. TC. C can't be sent between threads safely. Yeah. Oh, it just needs send. Okay, and that's fine. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, so then here, these have to be sync as well. Yep, and then we're gonna have, basically everywhere where we define that C, we'll have to say this is sync. Or send. Let's make sure. Yeah, it needs to be send, not sync. And almost everything is send, but very few things are sync. Those are good. Those are fine. Okay. Um. That's in run. I probably don't put the constraint on, oh, here, uh, C is send. Okay, and then run. Oh, what was that? There we go. Run. FN run, and then C is send. First use of C at 108. Send. What? Uh, 
Um, she was already used in 228. Uh, might not live long enough. I think that's fine. 640. Will this market static? Easy. Static and send. Static and send. Static and send. Static and send. All right, I think I think this should build. Nice. Okay, so that is going to give us an ability when we create a fuzzer. Um, not fun with a scope cell. Yep. So then up here, we'll just have our context down here. We'll have our context. Perfect. 97. Yep. Fuzz VM. Can't find value fuzz VM. Fuzz. Okay, and then we just need to add some type arguments here. So we'll now add a, this will be like global context used by all the fuzzers. Nice. Global context. And then we'll have an actual context structure, which is going to be elk base u size current allocation pointer. We'll call it elk pointer. Yep. And then these VMs, we'll take one of those, 88. Okay, expected three target arguments. Oh, it's building, nice. Okay, so now we just need a way of setting that up. Um, I think on IL, ILVM, I think we're just gonna make it uh, require that you implement default here maybe. If I make it require default, then I can just set it up. I can just create one automatically. Um, yeah, I think that's the cleanest way of doing it. We'll do a drive default here. Okay, and then the context. And then this will be a C default. Add a default constraint there. Oh, that was in the wrong spot. None. Impl dot star ILVM here. Oh, fuzzer state. Default. Default not implemented for C. Might just have to add that to everything. C default constraint, put a default constraint here. One thirty 
to Fuzzer State. Doop. Okay. Nice. Now, in here we'll do uh, pub fn get uh, context. Mute. Mute self. This will give a mutable reference to a C. This will just do mute self dot uh, fuzzer state. Get muta mutable access to the fuzzer state context. Okay, get access to it. Context. Done. Now, everything's done. So now I can say, when we fuzz, we'll do vm.context mute dot allocation pointer is going to be equal to ox. We'll start at, where did we put the stack? We put the stack at 4,000. I'm going to put the stack at 1,000. And then I'm going to put the program at uh, make file. I'm going to put the program at 2,000. OK. So and then I'm going to put this at 4,000. Set up the allocator to start at OX 4,000. Okay. SP is only eight bits and fix at one XX. Yeah, I know. Th where did you see that? Oh, this right here. This is the software stack. So it, it expects a pointer to a software stack at uh, zero. So the first two bytes in the null page, it expects to point to a software stack. This compiler just expects that. That's not a, or a virtual stack, I think they, they call it. OK, we set up this allocation pointer. And now we have faults here. What I'm going to say is if the address is equal to this, else this. So if the address is equal to that, then this is uh, end of fuzz case. So we'll just return. Otherwise, if adder is equal to OX, otherwise, if the address is equal to FFFE uh, malloc, so print malloc. We probably shouldn't overload like these these things. Um, I actually need a way of letting this continue. Or I get trap working. I could do I could do a trap. If I do trap, there's like no trap instruction, which makes it kind of difficult. Um, I could I could implement my own six five zero two instruction. That could potentially work. Because I want to use trap here. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to overload. I don't want to overload these faults. It's that's just so. That's so dangerous. Oops. So I'm gonna implement. What is an undefined opcode? Um, I think ff is undefined. Uh, six five zero two instruction set. So yeah, FF is undefined. So I'm going to say that FF is my own custom opcode. <laughs> uh, so we're going to have to go into this. And what does trap take? I think it takes a, an eight byte thing. So we'll do a trap. I think we'll just have it take an immediate we're going to make a new one called trap uh, custom OXFF opcode for custom OXFF opcode for invoking uh, trap. 
Okay. Then we just got to go to our table. We're going to say that FF. Or we'll call it TRP. TRP. And then this we're going to say it's an immediate. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. 898. Here we're going to say opcode terp. Custom custom 6502 trap instruction. And then we're going to have it take a single immediate. And then we'll do uh, let val is equal to load. Um, and I can just do a graph.trap. Oh, traps actually take aisle words. I should make them take non aisle words, but this should work. So how do we trap with a trap code? I think I'm going to make them take an extra argument. I think that'll be more extensible for, for what I want. So we're going to have trap uh, VM exited with a trap uh, given trap code and and values. OK. So then that's going to take an aisle word and an aisle reg. And then trap. This has another parameter, which is an input, which is a register. Um, we're going to call that val. So trap takes y and a value. Then we have trap here. And this is transform aisle reg inputs. So we're going to put x, and we'll grab fx here. Then we'll modify this to also uh, print the ILR this of the uh, val.0. OK, trap, uh, trap finishes blocks. That's true. And I need to put a comma in here. Traps here. This will take a val isle reg. Val. OK, sweet. We modified that, and the emulator's not happy. Um, trap. We'll just uh, just do that. Then we need to implement it in the JIT. So a trap. That's going to take uh, reg, and I'm just going to load that into uh, ZMM zero. So this will take the value. We'll do this. This will take a val into ZMM0. And then val, we're going to have to resolve. Resolve the value. And that will take val, val. So resolve that. And then we write that into ZMM0 on traps. Perfect. Now. Here, where we handle traps, where we make a trap code here, we're going to take uh, IL regs 0. Yep. OK, and then at 378, we'll also just have to handle this um, regs here. Or we can just, we can just say we ignore uh, the value here. OK, and then 902 for our trap. Uh, this is now going to take val. And we're not using adders. And that's in our own stuff. So now we have a custom instruction in 6502 that takes an immediate and then traps with that value. And then that will give us access to traps here we're gonna go uh here we're not using adders we're not using any of the fields technically okay and we're not using the context here okay so we have faults accessing that of course and then i'm gonna do aisle results trap code i think it was zero 
and then vals. Print trap the code and the values. Uh, lower hex not implemented. Okay, we'll just do this. Oh, whoops. Um, code vals. There we go. I was about to say that made no sense. Okay, so we're getting that MMU fault, which is fine because we explicitly have one. And then what I'm going to do, so this will complete. So this application will, will build and run. And then this will print MMU fault on the leet address. Yep, that's leet. And we'll just open up test main. Okay, and then instead of this, I'm going to do, uh, I'm guessing, so that does adder dot adder. How do I do a byte? Um, let's look at uh, A, where's the assembler? That's the disassembler, CA65. And then I want, oh, you can do scoping. That's kind of cool. Pseudo variable, pseudo functions. Dot adder. Okay. A8. Dot A8. Oh, sets so the accumulator. Okay. Adder. Define word size data. Um, byte. Dot byte. Byte size data. Okay. So then here we're going to do a byte. OXFF. OXFF. And that's going to be our exit. So now we should get... Uh, when we build it, trailing garbage characters, 10. Um, oh yeah, probably dollar signs here, yeah. Nice, okay, so now you should see trap with an FF. Nice, nice. Okay, so now I can say uh, let val is equal to vals dot extract zero. If val is equal to oxff return and of close case, else print trap. So now this shouldn't print ever, and we're just running our fuzzer. Everything's good. Looks great. Now I can go into here. I guess I can implement malloc up here. I can do uh, malloc... And then this, um, and standard lib will pick that up. So we just have our malloc implementation here. And I can just do byte FFOO. And that's our malloc. Okay. Um, is that not getting called? Like that works. I could just do uh, asm dot byte ff oo. Oh, I didn't build it. <laughs> yup. Yup. Okay, there's our malloc implementation. Uh, now that's not happy. Extern malloc, uh, void star malloc, size t. Maybe I do have to define it in C to make it happy. Pseudo instruction byte not supported. BYT. Can you not do pseudo instructions in this case? Uh, we can just call this malloc internal. And we could do like, uh, um, extern void star malloc int size t malloc internal call that return it size. 
Malik Int. Uh, export Malik Int. Hey, okay. That's going to do like a double call, which is kind of annoying. But there's our trap for our Malik. And then uh, I think, what's the calling convention? S um, I just want to look for OX1234. We're going to do that. And then I'm guessing... So the trap should finish a branch. So our register should be flushed on a trap case. So I should be able to get the registers. Um, so else if val is equal to zero, print x. I'm guessing it's probably a, then x, and x. So we'll do, uh, we'll do, Um, vm dot get reg register, and this will be a caused vm exit, and we want a, and we want x. Let's see, let's see if we have one two three four. Yeah, there's one two three four. It's actually x then y. Okay, so, um. Let a is equal to this. Let x is equal to this. Let param is equal to x uh, shift 8 or a. So then we have malloc x param. There we go. So what, how are returns done? Are returns done the same way? Where X is the high part and A is the low part? I'm guessing that's probably the case. Let's see if I can find an example. LDA. So I just need something that uses one of these addresses. And then, caused VM exit. Hmm. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna need a way to say that I handled the trap, so I need to like continue execution. Um, maybe I could return an address to return execution at. So I don't know where PC is, so I'm gonna need to get, I need to get access to PC so I know where I'm faulting. That's a hard problem. That's a really hard problem. How do I get PC? I guess in my instart, I can update PC. Uh, SP folk IL. Folk IL 6502 source int start. Yeah, so at an int start, we should do graph dot um, m IL word curb pc dot zero. Let pc is equal to, I'll call this temp pc, and then we'll do graph dot reg write register pc temp pc. Okay, so now I should have PC. We'll get PC up here. Uh, it's not. It's only going to be accurate for the trap. So we'll grab PC here because the register might not be flushed uh, on a fault, but everything else it should be flushed on. So now I can print malloc at uh, x PC. 2048. That's a good number. Okay, so we're going to grab uh, we're going to grab dev soft serve 6502 test test app 
grab the program, and this will like show us what we have. Uh, 6502, we're loading at two now. So I should be able to, we'll do P at two, and then we'll go to OX2048. Is that really where we are? I'm surprised I didn't pick up that in flow. Whoa. Oh yeah, that's the, okay, so. Then we're gonna jump to that plus two. So one, two, three, four, X, A. Then we jump to here. It doesn't like my like magic stuff too much. 2048, is that really the last instruction that executed? RTS. Why is that 2048? Is there like another undefined opcode? Um, maybe I'll switch to a different undefined opcode. Uh, six undefined opcodes. How they really work. LDN, L, yep. The kill opcodes. There are many kill opcodes. Opcodes that stop the CPU. It can only recover using a reset. Um, let's look at the different states. Okay. Yeah, I wanna I wanna kill opcode. <laughs> I just need a number. Extra opcodes. R L A. There's gotta be a, a full table. That's okay, yep. Uh, test for all. Extended opcodes. Hmm. I want like a, a table. Opcode eight. E, visual 6502, okay. Unpredictable. Even the same computer has been seen to act differently with the same inputs. XAA or A and E. Opcode 8B. So I'm going to guess that Ida does not like an 8B opcode. So let's, uh, let's edit in an 8B here. We'll put an 8B right here. And we're going to see if Ida lifts that. It does. Okay, I might just handle all of these opcodes. Ah, that's frustrating. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> 2048. Like, I feel like this this should be the address of a, of a trap. Um... Is that... That's the return. RTS. Okay, let's see what happens. Let's see what let's see what should be happening. We should go into here. We should JSR into this. That's going to load that up. It's going to call into OX2010. This. This is our undefined. At the current instruction, a 42 is an undefined opcode. Oh, it's uh, OX200A, which then it picked up in a weird alignment. That's fine. Um, here. Uh, undefine these. Yep. This. This is our, that calls 204D.
right? So we're going to start our application. We're going to call main. Main's going to load up one, two, three, four. It's going to call 200A, 2000A. Oh, that might be like a helper function thingy here. Okay. That. Then we have 2032 and return. Um, Malik at that. I'm doing something stupid here. Uh, okay. That. So this is our Malik. Oh, maybe it's using their Malik for some reason. But then how are we hitting our... Oh, okay, that does something, that does something. Then we jump to this. This is our Malik. We want 2008 here. Inst start, okay. Uh, Current PC, load an immediate, and then write that out to PC. A trap. Do we optimize past a trap? No, a trap should finish. I think for some reason we have a stale PC in there. Um, that means our optimizations are probably deleting it because it's, no, that target right should remain in that block. Um, let's take a look at our graph maybe. Well, that's gonna call and ret something. So I'm gonna say, well, first I wanna get rid of that, that like special case that we had. Okay, OXFF, that is the terp, and then we'll we'll do graph.dump dot when we hit a trap. So I'll run this locally. Cargo run release. Uh take a non parameter. This will be the unoptimized graph. And unoptimized it should always be correct. Uh, SVG, here we go. So somewhere in here we should have a, a trap, right? Um, that looks old. This looks old. Print, dump dot. Oh, it's never gonna execute. This is the this is the main function. Yeah, 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 yep. Um. Yeah, it's never making it to that dump dot. Say, hmm. What's a good way to debug this? We could we could run this on the server. Yep, and then on the server we can install graphviz. Okay, so now we should be able to run this. Uh, we'll run it single-threaded while we're debugging. And then the last graph on there should be the one that caused the malloc. So then we'll do a, we'll do a scoop. We'll scoop, uh, uh, dot S SVG dot. Nice. Okay, here we go. Here's our trap. So that's loading. 
2008. Yeah. 2008. It's loading that into ILR19, and then it's writing that to target 13. Okay, so that must be getting optimized out. No, a target write should never get optimized out. Graph.optimize. I might not be able to run the optimizer at this stage. I don't know if the optimizer allows it to... Uh, I don't think I allow two optimization passes. We don't need that. We don't need that. Okay. Optimize and then false. The flag's not used. Please work. Uh, can't add new instructions to graph after optimization phase. Um, oh, uh, the trap we need to continue. That's, it. yeah, it's probably really not liking that. Continue next explorer. Okay. That might be the bug. I, I need to, yeah, 2008 now. Okay, um, so that was the bug. I need to actually change that so that, uh, that it checks if you're adding an instruction after a trap. Um, but okay, that fixed it. So I'm gonna make note of that. So um, this is gonna be For this, we want to, um, we're going to want to, uh, don't allow insters past traps. Okay, so now we have 2008, which is good. That means our return site will be, uh, 2000A, um, so that's going to, trap so we call yeah this is directly after that fffff oh do i have a loop in there too still i do still have a loop so we don't need that we have malloc int directly after that makes sense and then malloc int uh then we want to do uh um an rs uh the re the return whatever the rts Okay, that's correct now. And then we'll just add two to PC and resume execution. It's not it's not gonna work right away. Um, so I'll want to do malloc and then I'll do vm.setreg cause vm exit register PC. Uh, set reg, uh, yeah, probably should give it a value. We'll do PC plus two. That will skip over the trap. That will cause it to continue execution. Obviously, it's it's not going to actually do that because um, before this gets invoked, this VM exit callback, um, I need a way to bring things back online. So cause VM exit, and then we'll do um, we'll have this return a mask of handled VMs of handled faults. Uh, VM exit callback, then this, let handled VMs is equal to this. And then I can do, uh, faulted VMs that permanently disabled by splatting. That should be fine, because that will get updated when we bring them back. So then, enable VMs which were handled. So online, we're going to get online, and then we're going to or in handled VMs, and then uh, dot raw. And then we're going to get faulted VMs is equal to faulted VMs and not handled VMs dot raw. So invert those. So, and FFF, okay, so that will unfault those. 
And then this will fail when we don't return the right parameter here. Okay. And then this returns a mask. And in this case, we'll return mask none. Uh, here, mask none. Okay, then this is mask none. And this case is mask. Uh, in this case, cause view makes it. We bring them all back on them. MMU fault uh, mask none. Nice. So the first time we hit a malloc, we should see that it goes to lift the following instructions. So, but did it? Okay, yeah. So here's the first malloc, and then we see it requesting a lifting of this. So it actually goes to continue execution at 2007, uh, which in this case is, is wrong because we have to reload the database, uh, reload the program. This, 6502, yep, this, 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 this. And this says we're continuing execution. So 2005 should be an FFO, good. We continue execution here, which is an RTS. And that will return us up to who called us. And so if we take a look at P here, this is main. Then in main we call, um, this is going to be malloc, and then here, this is calling 2005, that's going to return back, and then this, I don't know what all this crap is, but who cares? So that should be good. So now, okay, we're almost there. Um, I just need to know what a return looks like. I'm going to guess it's the same argument passing. I'm, I'm going to guess it's, it's, uh, X followed by A. So now we're going to return an address, and we'll return um, vm.setreg cause vm exit register x. We'll set this to oxde and then ad and a, dead. So dead and then in our code, we're just going to do a deref of buff times buff is equal to five, fine. So this should be writing to dead. Build, run. Um, and let's put this in hex mode on the faults. Okay, did we get it? Yeah, that's writing to dead. Okay, so now we just have to actually handle allocations. So we have the size. So this is the um, elk size get the allocation size then we can get our we can allocate at our current location so we're going to basically do this ho ho okay and this is going to be elk size as a use size so allocation size Allocation size, allocation size. So we're going to add memory at the um, uh, so we'll do let context is equal to vm dot get context. Then we'll get context. So we'll deref or we'll do context dot uh, elk base. And then here we're going to allocate elk size. So malloc this, and then we'll print at that, and then we'll return this. This will be the um, context.elk base. So allocation, the elk pointer is going to be equal to this. We'll allocate at the allocation pointer. We'll set it at the allocation size to writable, and then read after write. So it will catch uninitialized reads. And then in here, we'll do elk pointer. And then here we'll do uh, context.elk base plus equals um, elk size. And then this will be elk pointer 
and O X F F O O. Uh, shift eight. And then we'll do this is equal to O O F F shift zero. Okay, and we don't need online. In this case, it's not online. It's going to be cause vm exit. Param, not fun in the scope. 118. Yep. Um, elk size. Get context. Uh, it was just context, I think. Uh, it needs to be context mute. Um, then I call it elk base, elk pointer. Okay. We're going to call it elk base, current allocation pointer. That's going to fail in where I set it up for the first time down here. Okay, and now we just have some uh, reference issues. So we'll just do uh, elk base here, and then we'll do context plus equals that, and then standard mem drop. Uh, a cleaner way to do this would be this. Elk pointer is going to be, um, so you're going to put this in a scope. Let elk pointer is going to be equal to this. Then we return out elk pointer. Okay. So get access to the context, get the base, and set permissions. Um, ooh. Elk pointer, add memory, elk size. Uh, memory not present in master. Mm. I might need to allocate the whole slab. I think I can only change permissions. Yeah. So here, allocate room for the heap. This will be allocation pointer, which will be, uh, here, we'll do this alloc base this will be alloc base alloc size this will be a tunable const alloc base u size 4000 const alloc size u size 4000 so 4000 to 8000 in ram okay so there we're doing an allocation and we're returning 4000 as a valid thing, and then we set the permissions on that to write a, uh, writable and raw. Okay, so, and everything's working. We're actually able to succeed in writing to that location. Now, if we did this, if we read from it, this should fault because it's an uninitialized memory access. Yep, so there we go. We see a fault on accessing that. But if we did this, buff equals zero, and then we read from it, um, uh, times buff is equal to zero. Uh, I need to do char foo up here, and then we'll do foo is equal to times buff. So in this case, there's no fault because it's initialized. So it will check for uninitialized memory usage in all uh, situations there. So that's uh, that's why we have a byte level MMU. So now we have now we have basically ASAN implemented for the six five zero two. Um, so then, advanced PC past the trap. Uh, return out the sixteen bit pointer from Malik, and then uh, return that we handled all VMs. Okay. There we go. Uh, set memory as writable and readable after writes. And this is just like, um, so now if we, do, if we do another pointer here, so let's do another malloc. So we'll call this buff two. And in this case, so we'll alloc 16 bytes and then we'll alloc another 16 bytes. So in this case, we're actually gonna see um, we're going to see, uh, oops, 
Oh, I got rid of my print. That was a good print, too. I, I, I should keep that around. I should comment that out, but I shouldn't remove it because that's a it's a good it's a good print to have. So here I'm getting 4,010 for the next allocation. So we get an allocation, then we get another one. We return 4,010, and then the VM resets, and then we do 4,000, 4,010. So what we want to do is we want to add just a little bit of padding space. So here we're just going to add when we update elk base, we'll add another like 16. Um, and then we're going to, um, and then we'll assert context.elk base is less than, uh, elk base plus, or elk base plus elk size, uh, less than or equal to that. So this will check, um, allocator is oom. Um. So now we have 16 bytes of padding. Actually, we'll put 64 bytes of padding. So if you access 64 bytes out of bounds, so now we should see an allocation at 4050 because it's going to allocate, the next one would be at 4010, but we add the 40 hex bytes, 64, of padding. So the next allocation actually returns a 4050 allocation. Um, and then here we'll just do a dot checked add dot unwrap. And then this will be equal to this dot checked add dot unwrap so we'll make all of those fail if there's an integer overflow because that's a user controlled piece of data alloc base okay that looks good 2005 and then 4050 all right Sweet. So that means we can now, um, shit. Well, that's awesome. So now if we did a uh, buff 16 equals zero, that will fault. Oops. Um, we got to build it and then we'll get rid of our print. All right. Oops. Uh, yeah, we don't need that. Okay. So if we access the 16th byte, this will fault. And there we go. Access violation on 4010. And if we do 15, uh, we got to rebuild it. And then this one won't fault. So now we have 6502 with basically ASAN level protections. Awesome. That is what I like to see. 256. Let's see if this uh, the perf should be the same. I guess the allocation is going to be like kind of expensive to do. That's actually pretty good. We're getting 5.3 billion instructions per second, and we're getting, uh, yeah, we're getting 55 million fuzz cases per second here when we're handling handling these allocations. Remember, an allocation in this case is a is a VM exit. So, um, and we're resetting the processor from the start every time. So this means we are like basically starting our application from the start and uh, running it, performing the allocation, and then performing an out-of-bounds access uh, 50, 58 million times per second, which is awesome. So now that means uh, let's implement uh, free as well here. Uh, void times pointer. We'll do return... Um, Free int size. We'll do this. And that returns a void. So we got free. Oops. So free takes in a pointer. And then that's going to return, uh, oops, free of this. Okay. Obviously, that's not going to link because. Oh, it doesn't even want to return there. Okay, that's fine. Then we just need to make a free int here. Uh, and that's going to be an 01 RTS. Done. And then we'll call free buff. And then we'll do times buff equals 5. We're going to need to add a little bit more code in our side of things to handle the free. So... 
There's our trap on a, on a lane one, so that's saying, hey, we need to handle a trap of one, else if val is equal to ox01. Then in this case, we're going to do kind of the same thing. Uh, get the uh, pointer to free. Free pointer is equal to that. Then at the end, we're going to advance uh, past the trap. Looks good. So PC, PC plus equals two. We don't return anything. Cause view makes it. Uh, return that we handle all of these. And then we just need to add a database. So we'll add um, active allocations. This will be a hash map of a U16, which is an address to a size. Um, mapping of active allocations to their sizes. Then down here, we're just gonna implement uh, VM dot um, uh, here. We'll do, here we'll do a, a active a context dot active allocations dot insert elk base elk size and both these will were stored as u16s um, update the active allocation table okay and then we're going to assert that this is none we we want to make sure there's only one active allocation at an address that that should be fine and then the next thing we want to do is we want to take out of this context. So we'll do let uh, so we'll do let context is equal to vm dot context mute. Get the active context and what do I want? Active allocations insert. I want a Rust hash map, and we're gonna see what we can do for hash maps. I want to like a uh, I want like remove, remove by K. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so here we're gonna say, um, we're gonna do uh, advanced PC. We got the pointer to free. So here we're gonna do allocations, context uh, act, all, active allocations dot remove uh, the free pointer as U16. Then I'm going to um dot expect uh so let elk size is equal to this so the allocation size is equal to this and we're going to expect um free of invalid pointer so now you have free checks and then uh we can actually just have this be let elk size is equal to this and now I just want to unset those permissions. So mark mark the memory as no longer accessible. We'll set this to zero. Done. So cause beam exit uh, for the free pointer as u size. Oh, it's already u size. Free pointer for the allocation size as u size here get the allocation size from the active allocation map and then done and some just stuff here and 129 uh elk base elk pointer and then 166, uh, this needs to be borrowed. Okay, and that's faulting um, because we're trying to access memory that's freed. And if we did free buff plus one, this will fault as well. In this case, this will actually panic, but that's fine, not a big deal. So free of invalid pointer. So now, now we have Malik and free, and if, so we have Malik and free, and we have use after free checks, we have double free checks, we have uninitialized memory use checks, and we have out of bounds access checks up to 64. So we'd check, uh, we would catch any um, heap overflow. We wouldn't check an out of bounds by uh, a far 
reference. Okay. Um, and we could technically implement realloc too. So size t um, realloc. Uh, I think it's uh, wow, man not found. So man realloc. In this case, we're gonna grab a. Uh, oh, we want calic as well. So we're just gonna get all these implemented. Uh, it takes the old pointer. And it takes the size. So in this case, we don't actually... So realloc we can implement. And then uh, calic we can also implement. These are easy. So here we'll just do um, let or er, void times pointer is equal to malloc of nmemb times size. Technically that overflows, don't really care mem set pointer of 0 and mem b time size done so now we have calic and then realloc uh, this will do a void times temp is equal to a malloc of size is the new size yeah so we'll do malloc of actually realloc is kind of hard cuz i have to know the size of the last one Yeah, I don't know the size of the last allocation. We're just going to ignore realloc for now. Uh, but calic. Okay, that's done. Um, And then we return pointer. Call it undefined. Yeah, this is in uh, string.h. Just tuned in. What are you working on? We're working on a 6502 emulator that... Um, allows us to fuzz things really fast. So it's a super high performance 6502 emulator, and it has like a bunch of memory protections that allow us to catch bugs in 6502 applications. And then I just implemented kind of uh, malloc free and calic. So now I'm going to be able to, um, uh, and then B times size. So now I'm gonna be able to um, uh, use, I probably can just like take some, example application and now build it in this case so kernel entry i'm gonna put these on on these this is kind of my typical coding style for c it's a little bit more verbose but whatever but yeah like here we're crashing because we have a use after free um so now i just need some c code <laughs> now i just need some c code to build so all right. Well, this looks really good. I actually like uh, where this is at. So um, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to go for a bike ride while it's still uh, sunny out, while it's still daylight. And then maybe maybe I'll stream again later tonight. I'm, I'm not quite sure. But basically, I'm in a point where now I can just take any C application that uses just like standard libc things and malloc free and calic, and I'll be able to fuzz it and find... Um, find bugs in it. So sweet. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Maybe I'll see you around a little bit later.